Well, good morning. It is nine o'clock, the appointed hour. We have a quorum present, and therefore I would like to go ahead and call to order this meeting of the Douglas County Board of Commissioners. This meeting will be conducted in compliance with Nebraska's open meeting laws, a copy of which is on the back wall. Would you please join me in the, with the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I would ask people to please silence your telephones or electronic devices, if you would. Uh, this is the first meeting where we are not allowed to participate virtually uh, as, as things somewhat return to normal. Uh, however, Commissioner Kraft is still going to be joining us electronically. Uh, he no longer counts for, towards a quorum or is able to vote. Um, but I urged him to participate uh, by telephone. It is best that he not be here with us if he doesn't really have to be. So. Uh, Commissioner Kraft is joining us by telephone but, or by Zoom, but has no longer got the ability to vote. Yeah, Having, he can speak, he can speak. <laughs> if we let him. We'll, we'll, we'll see when the time comes. Uh, having said that, would you please call the roll, Mr. Clerk? Commissioner Borgeson? Here. <clears throat> Commissioner Boyle? Here. Commissioner Cavanaugh? Here. Uh, Commissioner Morgan? Here. Commissioner Rogers? Here. Uh, Commissioner Kraft is attending virtually but cannot vote, uh, and then Mr. Chair. Present, thank you. This is the Board of Equalization, I did not mention that. Uh, item A is approval of minutes from June 30th meeting. Item B is to set July 28th as the date for hearing on certified assessment corrections. What is the pleasure of the Board? Motion and a second to approve A and B. Are there questions or comments? Then could we please vote? One moment, please. Okay, thank you. Commissioners Cavanaugh and Rogers. Okay. Motion, pa uh, motion by Commissioner Boyle, second by Commissioner Morgan. Motion passes six to zero. Thank you. Citizen comments, would anybody like to address the Board of Equalization on anything that is not on the agenda? Good morning, Larry. Good morning. Larry Storer, 5015 Lafayette Avenue, Omaha, 68132. Some recent news developments that I think we all should be very concerned about. Various cities and counties are now saying we've got to raise property taxes to meet our expenses. I expect that'll be a discussion that probably already has been in these halls. And I think the citizens ought to be aware of that and start getting ready to say no. Let's cut some programs. Let's cut some of the unnecessary spending that you can do without for a while, such as these programs and best practices that maybe aren't proving out. Uh, I don't want to sell my house. And what are you going to do if we all sell our house? We can't afford to live in it. The young people aren't going to come. And all the stuff you're spending money on now in these tax increment schemes, uh, going to cause a failure of the whole cabal. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Would anybody else like to address the Board of Equalization? If not, we have resolutions D through E. We do not have need that I'm aware of for executive session on, on DOE. And so a motion could in, include adjournment. Motion by Commissioner Rogers, second by Commissioner Morgan to approve resolutions D, E, and adjourn questions or comments. Then could we please vote? The commission. All right. Okay. All right. Excuse me, Mike. Please All continue. Right. All right. Uh, I'd just like uh, to have someone uh, talk a little bit about this because so the taxpayers know there's a change to uh, uh, how they're going to be 
uh, received, isn't there? I mean, we're going to be using some people other than uh, uh, referees to uh, um, to uh, do the uh, to hear the protests. And uh, I, I just here here is Catherine Hall. Oh, I, I think years ago we used to hire anybody as a, as a referee. We had very little in the way of qualifications. We had a lot of part-time okay. real estate agents, things like that. Anybody right. that said they knew anything about real estate. We chose many years ago to raise the bar and say we only want to hire professional appraisers. Now, having said that, Catherine, where, where are we at this year? So just, I think the board's already familiar, but the general challenge this year is that protest volume is uniquely high. I think this is the biggest number of protests we've seen come in since perhaps 2007. So it's a busy protest volume year. Our protest volume is, I think, the highest it's been since 2007. And I think also um, proportionally a higher number of pro property owners are requesting appointments when they file their protests. And thirdly, we have a number of referees that the board does hire to work to review, review um, protests. And private appraisal work is just so busy this year that we're having trouble getting availability for referees. So that's combining and we're really having a hard time accommodating the number of requests for appointments. So this is a proposal to give the board the option to hire non-appraisers, real estate professionals, real estate brokers to also function as referees this year, um, should that be necessary to accommodate the requests for appointments that are exceeding the current availability. So. May I ask? Uh, the floor is yours, Commission Board. How do you expect, uh, how will uh, taxpayers be affected by this? They'll just be, will they still be able to get appointments? I know some people have been, had their appointments canceled and so forth. And yes. What, what is the number this year that's the record since 2007? I didn't check this morning, but I, I could defer to Dan if you have that number. It's uh, Dan Ash County Clerk. Uh, we're at, six, I don't have an exact number with me, but it was over 6,800. Okay. So 2007 was an unusually high year. We had 10,000 some, but uh, okay. uh, this was this is the second highest since that, or the highest since that year. Okay. So this should help. This is a, um, an exception or a proposed amendment to your procedures and policies to help because right now, as of today, the requests for appointments exceed the availability of referees we've, that the board has already hired. So this is an attempt to address that and hire more um, qualified individuals to function as referees in order to accommodate those appointment requests. Okay, and uh, is there uh, any any relief? I mean, if a taxpayer gets, because I do know someone who had theirs canceled, I think they might finally got in, but is there any anywhere they can go to talk to someone about this or do they just kind of keep trying the phone? I don't know, I don't understand what they're supposed to do if they get uh, knocked out. Yeah, well, I, we've got, uh, I mean, a list of everyone we're, we're doing the best to get through. The clerical right. staff is calling as soon as we have referee availability they're calling okay. through to match up appointments. Um, so certainly they could call the BOE help desk if they've had trouble co connecting. That's 402-444-6510. Okay. Catherine, thanks a lot. You're doing a great job with under a very strange situation. Thank you. Hey, challenging your Commissioner yeah. Morgan. Yeah. Uh, I'll echo what Mike just said about uh, the job you're doing and Commissioner Boyle I had my appointment set up for three weeks because I had about a 48% increase in the value of my home that I've lived in 40 years and no building permits in more than 30 years, so it isn't like we did an addition. But uh, they canceled mine at three in the afternoon before my appointment the next morning at nine. He told me to send in my papers. I mentioned to Catherine that I'd do a phone deal and she was able to set it up for me, which worked out really well and I am appreciative of that. You'd rather meet in person, but the phone was helpful and good. I think on this resolution, it'd be good if at least they had an appraiser license. You know, uh, you can get one through the state and then you can do it with some organizations. I know I had both at one time with the independent fee appraisers. Uh, and then one through the state in Nebraska. But uh, what's the last date of being able to have an interview? What is the calendar date? We had originally planned for uh, appointments to wrap up by the end of this week, but it just wouldn't be possible. So we're kind of extending week by week. 
um, in order to accommodate. So we haven't set a final end date now. I would guess we'd going at least through July. So you can do that. You can go through the end of July if you want by statute and so on. Sure. Really, the 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 bookend we have at the other side is that this board needs to take action by August 10th. So the further we push the appointments and the review, the the less time this board has to review the recommendations, and I know that's a challenge as well. Um, and it seems likely this board will need to schedule a special meeting to accommodate all those, the, the protests we've got right now, you have to take action by August 10th, and the Tuesday nearest to August 10th is August 4th, which would really truncate the review time. Okay, uh, and I think that is really helpful, and I think we will have people probably coming to the Board of Equalization, and I'm hearing that from some of the commercial hotel owners and that kind of thing to come, because certainly this virus has affected uh, those properties. My understanding is, and you can correct me, please, uh, my understanding is if you couldn't get an appointment and don't have a chance for an interview, that then it's automatically denied and you're to go to Turk is what I've heard. If you didn't get the appointment, and that's why you're trying to make sure people can get that appointment. I believe the language of the law is that the, every um, protester. And, and commissioners, I can I can jump in and, and talk to that as, as well. So the, the law says that every protester is entitled to a hearing. There's nothing in the, from my understanding in the statute, and Teresa can speak to this if she wants, that sp talks specifically to what happens if they don't, but there's an old law from the late 1800s, which is a case law. It's a, a case decision, Supreme Court, I believe, that says basically it's, that it's denied. It's considered denied, and then they can appeal it. That that if it's if it's not heard by the board, then it's denied, and then they appeal it. So that's where we're at, and there's no guarantees that we're going to be able to hear all of them, considering all of the hurdles that we're facing. We're very hopeful with with the actions today that we'll be able to do that, but there's no guarantees. That's serious. May I, may I jump in? I just have to say, if we if you don't get an appointment, your protest, is, the Danish County Clerk, your protest is not automatically denied. We have roughly every year 50 to 60 percent of the protests that don't request an appointment. That protest is still heard. Mm -hmm. if, yeah. But if you if you request an appointment, we do our very best to get it at a time you want. But we are certainly. I mean, I talk to Lancaster and Sarpy, they pretty much tell the person, this is when your meeting is, if that doesn't work for you, too bad. Like, we are, yeah. we are way more accommodating than any other county in Nebraska, and that's why we're trying to do this right now, is to get more referees to help us get people meetings who want them. Very good. Thank you, Dan. Further questions or comments? I have one other procedural question. I'll ask, I'll ask Dan, though, myself. It's just about when we get this material, because it's right. so late in the game for us. Okay. All right, if there's no further discussion, could we please read? Thanks, Catherine. Commissioner so, Kavanaugh. Um, Ms. Hall, we've had uh, some talks about uh, adding uh, additional referees, and I think it came up that uh, there might be a possible qualification uh, for uh, attorneys uh, who practice under the Nebraska Bar Association qualifying. Um, were we able to determine whether or not that serves as a qualification for a referee? Well, so in in consultation with the county attorney's office, it seems like the the law doesn't spe the state doesn't specify a certain standard, just other than qualified. So in the past, this board has sort of narrowed the scope of what you determine to be qualified, um, and so I. I Ultimately, I think that's up to this board. The way the proposed revision is written as, is as real estate professionals, but certainly the board um, could expand that to include whatever kind of professionals you would determine to be qualified. So what you're talking about are, are, are two things. There's the state requirement, and then there is the county board resolution that we passed. Correct. I'm talking about how could we make our resolution mirror the state requirement, and would that allow us a broader pool of people from which to draw but referees? It, on the screen, using the well, browser. The state requirement it is not very specific. 
Um, so this board may, at this morning, at your meeting, choose to revise the, your policies yeah. and procedures however you see fit okay. to define that so we can what you determine to be qualified. Catherine, sorry to interrupt you. Folks, if you're on the Zoom call, could you please mute yourself right now? Thank you. So just to reiterate, that I don't believe the state law is very specific in defining what the standards for a referee for these purposes. So the board here this morning, you may choose to define um, qualified as you see fit. And right now the proposed language includes real estate professionals, but you could certainly refine that or add more to it. So relative to the matter that's before us right now, would that allow us to just make it compliant with the state statute so that we'd have a broader pool to draw from? I believe you are in compliance with state statute now and broadening who you select as a referee would likely still be with in compliance with state statute but not any higher than the state statute. Correct. The state statute is not very specific as to what standard a That's referee what should be. So we would be simply mirroring the state statute in terms of uh, qualifications for a referee, yes or no? Commissioners, let me no. jump in here. It's not, what she's saying is the statute doesn't really prescribe what the standards have to be. So you could say everybody in the world could be a referee and you would be in compliance with state statute for the most part. So all she's saying is right now it's real estate professionals is what's before the board. If you want to amend that to include attorneys that have real estate experience, then certainly that would also be within, within the compliance with the state statute because the state statute is so broad. So, you know, I guess my question would be if I'm a real estate attorney I am an expert under this language, presumably. I mean, the fact that I'm an attorney is just an extra credential. But if, if our criteria is you gotta be a real estate expert, there's no license for real estate expert. I mean, that's not, a, not an objective criteria like there is to be a licensed attorney or to be a licensed physician. I, I'm just trying to figure out where we're setting the bar so that we can get the maximum number of qualified people available to be referees, because we have a shortage, right? Correct, yeah. All right. So relative to the shortage, and we had this discussion as well, <clears throat> we're short because of some retirements, we're short because of some COVID impact and other factors relative to our usual complement of referees. How many would you estimate are we short right now? Boy, it's difficult to articulate a specific number because referees, their availability, you know, we have some referees who are working four or five days a week right now, and we have some who just do maybe a half day. So it's not really apples to apples because they're not all contributing the same amount of time. We have probably two or three, and I should say too, this is mostly specific to the residential properties is where our referee shortage is. I believe the commercial properties were sufficiently or pretty close to pretty sufficiently staffed. Um, so there are perhaps two to three who didn't return this year, who did work for us last year. Um, but again, it's not, it's difficult to say how because they don't all keep the same schedules or availability. I understand and, and I wanna say, I appreciate all the hard work that you've been doing and the, and the county clerk Dan Esch has been doing to kind of bridge this gap. It is a bit of a perfect storm in terms of the shortage. So year to year, we had X number of referees last year and we have Y number of referees this year. Can you tell me what those numbers would be? I don't have it off the top of my head. Um, we're pretty close. Like I said, there are probably, I think there are three this year who didn't return who have participated last year. But each number, the each year the number varies a little bit. Total, we perhaps have about 15 referees working each year, but again, that's an average. Uh, if, I, if, if I may, if you don't mind, Catherine. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we had um, 19 total last year, three coordinators, 16 referees. And this year, I think we're down to 12 referees. But like Catherine's saying, the issue is their availability is not like it used to be. We pretty much only have two referees that are everyday people. I mean, the, not like, like Catherine said, the commercial while it's, they're a little overwhelmed as well, or overwhelmed is not the right word, but while they're busier than usual, I think we're generally okay there. It's the residential. And uh, if I can correct something, or I said earlier, right now we have 
6,953 protests. Some of those have been heard. I know, I know at least 15 to 1,600 have been heard, but we still have 2,306 appointments to schedule. So I don't know how to put a number on referees. We just need more, and hopefully this language will uh, um, allow us to get some more referees. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Commissioner That's great. Morgan. Thank you. Will you be the one, or who will be the person interviewing the real estate people that you might hire to do this job? Yeah, I'd be glad to reach out to any um, to names, and I could work in coordination, cooperation with the board um, for any names we have, we want to pursue. Okay. Yeah, I think I'd have a conflict uh, doing that. <laughs> but uh, okay, I'll talk with you maybe after the meeting and by phone or whatever way in case you're not available. Just about how we kind of get that going and maybe calling a few of the companies to see Berkshire and some of the others in P. Dodge to see if they have some people that might be interested, put it out as a notice. You know, if if you suggest that's helpful, I want you to do it, and I respect what you suggest. Okay. Sure, I, I would welcome any suggestions from the board as how to approach it. Typically, you know, we go from our standard pool of referees, and sometimes this year we've already I've sent an um, inquiry to um, registered, certified, licensed real estate appraisers in Douglas County. So we've already kind of gone to that next level and gotten about I think as much response as we're going to get. So I'm certainly open to the feedback from the board is how to pursue the next step. Yeah, and I'd like to see us get the real estate agents that are licensed appraisers in the state of Nebraska, if we can, but I'm great with the other and your judgment. So we will talk and thank you again for what you do. Thank you. Further uh, questions or comments? I, I'm sorry, Chris, I'll, I'll stop after this. I just, uh, <laughs> kind of quick, I just want to remind everybody that there's it's a two-tier review, so every protest will be reviewed by a referee coordinator who, of course, has a lot of credentials. This Correct. is just the yeah. initial review. Perfect. Thank you for the clarification. Could we please vote? I have to uh, start this over because right. we stopped in the middle, so give me one moment, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Morgan, you having trouble working the? <laughs> uh, you give me a hard time. I got to do it to you every once in a while. Uh, motion passes six to zero. Thank you. We will now convene as the Board of Corrections. Could we please have the roll call? Commissioner Borgeson? Here. Commissioner Boyle? Here. Commissioner Cavanaugh? Here. Uh, Commissioner Morgan? Here. <laughs> Commissioner Rogers? <laughs> Mr. Chair? Present. Uh, item one is approval of the minutes from the Board of Corrections meeting on June 9th. Anybody? Thank you. Do we have a second? All right, second by Commissioner Borgerson. Um, questions or comments to that? If not, could we please vote? Motion by Commissioner Boyle, second by Commissioner Borgeson. Motion passes six to zero. Thank you. Citizen comments, would anybody like to address the Board of Corrections on anything not on the agenda? If not, we will move to the report from the Director of Corrections, Mr. Mike Myers. Good morning, Mike. Good morning, Commissioners. Michael Myers, Director of Corrections for Douglas County. Uh, you have before you my report uh, for the month of June of 2020. Um, enclosure number one, administrative services. We finished the year uh, under budget um, by $42,349. Our overtime costs during June were $383,450. This is an increase over the previous two months. Primarily the increase can be attributed to an increase in exception time as we enter the summer months and staff are more staff are on vacation. Um, we have staffed additional positions. Uh, we also staffed additional positions during the period of civil unrest 
and we are also staffing COVID-19 related positions which were not accounted for in our staffing plan. So that those three factors mainly have driven uh, the, the increase in overtime in June. In closure number two, community corrections and in-house programs. Um, again, due to the ongoing impact of COVID-19, uh, our, our activities and our data are significantly different from the norm. Um, many staff have been repurposed so that some of other essential functions can continue. Um, <clears throat> in the absence of our contracted program providers, our case management staff and other personnel have taken the initiative to implement activities to supplement that loss of resources. We have individuals, who, officers who are stepping up and uh, creating or getting curriculums and doing small group activities and so forth, both in the jail and in community corrections. So that's uh, very encouraging to see that amount of buy-in and commitment to their program um, in, during a time when we are unable to bring in all of the volunteers and contractors who, do the, who traditionally do those services. The Criminal Justice Center, which houses community corrections, was closed uh, in response to the ongoing civil unrest in the area from May 31st through June 8th. This was done for the safety of staff and clients who were residing uh, in the Work Release Center. We had one individual who served eight days in our sanction center. Twelve individuals served a combined 62 days in the Transitional Discharge Center. Our reentry services staff um, had significant portions of their workday converted to co facilitating court hearings and other legal functions. There were 498 court hearings, um, including federal court, district court, juvenile court, and an interesting um, phenomenon is that actually facilitating court in other counties, which is a benefit for us because it clears up holds that individuals have for other counties. So typically under normal circumstances, an individual would stay in our custody. Um, they could get to their release date. If there's a hold for another county, we'd have to continue to, to remain, have that person in our custody until the other county came and retrieved them. Um, we're seeing, this is a practice that I hope that we can continue even after this pandemic is over. Uh, it's, we're able to um, get those other jurisdictional matters dealt with uh, so that when they're done with us, they can be released and we don't have to hold them and have them be transferred to another county. <clears throat> and we have facilitated 51 hours of viewing discovery materials. The 24-7 sobriety operations have changed drastically as we converted from a face-to-face -to, -face to a largely remote program. And we have seen, there are consequences to those decisions as we have seen more um, positive tests as people are, their frequency of being held accountable and tested has decreased. There were 47 individuals placed on the program. Um, there were 1,871 breath tests that were completed using remote technology. 19 were positive for alcohol use and there were three no-shows. The overall compliance rate for breath testing was 99.8%. 38 individuals were monitored for a total of 906 days of SCRAM monitoring. Those are the ankle bracelets which detect alcohol use. There were um, two no-shows for data download, two tampering violations, and there were zero alcohol violations. The overall SCRAM compliance rate was 99.9%. There were 28 saliva drug tests administered with six violations. And one of the, the um, methods of testing that we've utilized much more frequently than in normal times is the drug testing patch. And that is where an individual wears a patch probably on the back of their shoulder. They wear it for up to two weeks and then we, they come in and we collect the patch and send it in for, uh, for testing. We utilized 113 drug testing patches and 40 of them came back positive with violations. Work release admitted eight individuals. House arrest admitted 106 individuals. You can see our work release numbers have greatly been impacted by the pandemic and um, 
the cohorting process that we utilize to keep people safe has drastically reduced the numbers of individuals who are available to go to work release. The Reentry Assistance Program, or RAP, admitted 18 individuals, and five individuals were placed on electronic monitoring through that program. In the jail, 71 individuals were admitted to corrections programs. Pretrial Services continues to provide daily information to the courts regarding candidates for bond reduction, early pleas, and, and early pleas in response to the pandemic. 16 individuals were referred for priority prosecution, which saved 195 bed days. 300 individ 320 individuals were placed on pretrial release. And overall, 1,350 individuals were managed during the course of the month on pretrial release with a 94% compliance rate. 221 individuals visited the law library. In closure number three, uh, compliance. Um, we continue to uh, gather our documentation for our upcoming ACA accreditation audit, which will occur later this fall, either in late October or early November, though that process may be impacted by the pandemic. Um, we'll have to see how it, the American Correctional Association is going to respond at that time. Um, they are taking some steps to try and do some of their functions virtually, um, avoiding air traffic or travel for, for auditors. Um, and it'll really just depend on how we're doing locally, I think, at that time as to whether we'll have auditors come in the building at that time or ask the American Correctional Association for an extension of some sort um, and have them come in at a time that's more safe for everyone. In closure number four, personnel. Uh, 17 new officers graduated from the academy training on June 26th. Uh, this was our first attempt at a virtual graduation ceremony as well. We were able to accommodate family and friends from across the nation who wouldn't normally have been able to attend. We intend to keep the virtual option going forward even after the pandemic has subsided. We anticipate a class of approximately 15 officers joining the Department of Corrections for their training academy beginning on July 20th. Unless staffing levels deem otherwise, we will conduct quarterly academies from this point forward. Seven officers, all below the rank of sergeant, left employment in June. We concluded the month having 377 out of our authorized 396 uniform staff. During the recently concluded fiscal year, we had a net gain of 43 correctional officers. And I do want to point out that there was a time um, when we were, we had dropped about 25 from when the fiscal year began. So we've made a nice rebound in the last nine months. Um, I think the credit to that goes to our efficiencies we've gained in our hiring and training, training practices, as well as an increased focus on retention efforts and staff development. In closure number five, our population, we had 1,397 admissions. There are 1,336 admissions, or excuse me, releases. Our high count was 1,252, and our low count was 1,147. Our average daily population was 1,187. That is an increase over the previous month that did subside a bit towards the end of the month and then into the beginning of July. Custodial sanction bed days were at 66. This is a continued steep decline. Uh, so I am um, want to give kudos to probation for finding alternatives to incarceration um, and, and managing individuals who have misstepped on probation in ways that don't default uh, to jail days. The U.S. Marshal population has increased, the ICE population decreased, the felony pretrial population increased, the misdemeanor pretrial population increased. To an extent, this was influenced by arrests during the civil unrest. Uh, probation violations remain stable and the female population in, increased slightly. One of the four um, Female housing units has been closed and is currently being used as our quarantine facility. 
Enclosure number six, medical. There are 1,218 intake screenings. There are 334 health and physical assessments. And inmates were sent out 20 times for medical care. Nine of those were by 911. There were five hospital admissions, which resulted in a total of 13 days of hospitalization. Enclosure number seven, mental health. There were 128 initial psychiatric assessments, 98 initial mental health assessments, 57 mental health infirmary placements. There were four Board of Mental Health referrals and three referrals to long-term psychiatric facilities. Um, and well, as of last week when I asked the question, the Lincoln Regional Center was still on a hold for accepting new placements as a result of a COVID outbreak in that facility. So folks who are in our jail awaiting that uh, service are still waiting. Other noteworthy items, the Department of Corrections continues to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. We implemented additional COVID-19 testing for inmates during June. We developed this process in, cult in consultation with the Douglas County Health Department to shorten the initial observation period following admission, which was needed as a result of an increase in our population. Testing will allow us to clear individuals into the general population sooner to free up space for more for cohort separation. To date, or uh, as of June or end of June, uh, we had tested approximately 80 inmates. Um, the only positive results had come from individuals who were positive when they were booked into the facility. Approximately 200 staff members have been tested since the onset of the pandemic. At the end of June, six had tested positive. Again, at, I, I want to clarify because I'm not sure that this is going to hold true much longer. <clears throat> As of the end of June, there is no evidence that any of these cases were related to each other. No staff member who was tested as a result of our contact tracing tested positive. Thus far, our measures to keep the virus from spreading within the facility when it has been introduced from the community appear to have been and continue to be effective. Our COVID-19 quarantine unit was open throughout most of the month due to individuals who had tested positive in the community or had a known exposure in the community prior to their prior to booking. Um, we have been concerned that the high number of arrests which occurred during protests may increase our COVID exposure risk, but um, we believe that we probably have weathered that storm um, for the most part. Uh, we would like to continue to express our thanks to the Douglas County Health Department for their frequent guidance and use of resources. Uh, we have recently begun the resumption of projects that were set aside at the onset of the pandemic. Those include re requests for proposals for body-worn cameras, the solicitation of bids for a body scanner, requests for proposals for program evaluation, requests for for proposal for tablet devices for incarcerated persons, a request for proposals for pretrial release supervision software, among many other projects that are getting back online. And finally, um, we, we have also given our strategic planning process a reboot after those efforts were suspended at the onset of the pandemic. We are giving special attention to diversity, equity, and inclusion throughout the strategic plan. Not only are we establishing a committee specifically to address these initiatives comprised of representatives of the African American Correctional Officers Association, the Fraternal Order of Police Lodge 8, and DCDC administration, but I have also challenged the leadership team to integrate the principles of diversity, equity, and inclusion into all aspects of our strategic plan. We will not give these goals lip service. We are, we are committed to establishing and maintaining meaningful and positive change by codifying those principles into our mission on a permanent basis. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Commissioner Morgan.
Thank you very much, Mike, and it looks to be going in the right direction, and also want to welcome back Amber, who I know is a great assistance to your team down there. Absolutely. So it's great I'm, to have her back. I'm very happy to have Amber back. Today. Commissioner Kavanaugh. Um, thanks for this report. It, um, I think it's been one of our uh, qualified successes anyhow relative to the containment of uh, COVID in the correction center. Could you just give us a quick snapshot since the onset of the pandemic? Uh, how many positive COVID tests have we had among staff? How many positive uh, COVID tests have we had among inmates? Um, yes, yeah, so right now, and I have confirmed, uh, and some of this post-dates the, these statistics in this report, um, we have had um, eight, no, excuse me, yes, eight confirmed um, positive tests for staff. Um, and we have had seven inmates. Again, they have all come to the facility with uh, that we knew when, at the time of booking that they had they had a positive test prior to their booking. You know, that's really remarkable when we read every day the experience of the Nebraska correctional system, which is far worse than this. And I just wonder, and, and, you know, you did some significant preparation uh, for containment and, uh, of the of the COVID uh, virus. Um, could you just recap for us basically the, the main things that you attribute this very, very low case count to? Because, I mean, this is over months and months and over thousands of people. That's a significantly lower level than the Nebraska correctional system uh, has experienced. Um, <clears throat> we did do, we did jump on this very early. Um, and one of my most important um, um, strategies and with any uh, tackling any challenges to go to people who are smarter than I am um, and and get their guidance and assistance and we reached out to the Douglas County Health Department um, the experts at Nebraska Medicine um, and also gathered resources from other sources um, for very early on to try and understand I think the biggest um, I think the the biggest thing we've done is developing that fairly elaborate cohorting system for their for individuals first 14 days in custody oh. um, and I need to give a lot of credit to our classification staff um, who have this never-ending puzzle that they have to keep fitting pieces in uh, in order to maintain those cohort groups um, individuals are housed with people who came in either on their same day or within a day um, and each housing unit these are on our Celled housing units only, our, our annex where it's more open barracks style, nobody can go to those housing units until they've cleared that 14 day period. Um, and so individuals come out of their, we, we have had to restrict individuals freedom of movement more than we would like. Um, individuals in, only come out with their own cohort into the, out of the day room uh, to have their recreation, um, to be able to use their, the phones to call their families. Um, you know, to, to shower and so forth. Um, so the day room times for everyone have, have been reduced because we have to close it except for specific groups um, that are within cohorts up until they get to that, uh, that, that 15th day. Uh, then they're assessed by our medical staff um, to make sure there's no symptoms present. And then they go, and if they're eligible, they'll go on into general population from there. We have also, probably roughly tripled our sanitation and dis disinfection routine throughout the facility. Um, that's made a big difference. Um, we also adopted masks for all of our staff on April 3rd. Um, it was a few weeks later uh, that we did a partial um, implementation, implementation of masks for our incarcerated population. Uh, once we got another shipment of 3,000 masks in um, so that we could not you need a sufficient supply of masks so that you can launder them on a regular basis uh, in addition to the one that everybody has uh, that they're wearing. Um, so it was about a, probably a few weeks after we d uh, implemented it for the, for the staff that we put um, or asked inmates to wear masks. 
Um, they've been largely complying with that, not everyone, and it's obviously not a, a, a situation where we're going to, we can't forcefully make it, it somebody and compel them to wear the mask, but for the most part, um, we have seen compliance from the incarcerated population. Well, again, kudos to you and the brave men and women who work at the Correction Center. You've done a remarkable job under really tough uh, conditions, so uh, thanks for that. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Boyle. Yes, I want to follow up with what Commissioner Cavanaugh said. It, it, uh, you really pulled it off. It's hard to believe what you did with Dr. Poor's help and her department as well as UNMC. Um, I sent an email to Dr. Poor probably, oh, I don't know, a month ago and just said, is there anything we should be doing? I'm, just, I'm, a bit, I'm a little bit edgy. I was a little bit edgy about having all those people there and not being tested and what we were doing. And, and she wrote back a, a very interesting report and quite accurate, put me at ease, that said, you know, it's under control over there and talked about, you know, the, what you had done to meet the UNMC standards and the health department. And so it really, uh, I felt very comfortable uh, being the commissioner that works with you uh, that you had it under control and we had uh, some expert uh, uh, indications that you did. So I'm really happy you did that. And it is remarkable when you look around the country at what's happened and where there's so many people confined like that. And I think what it does is, and it's, inter it's good that the taxpayers know this, that uh, we treat, people who are in our care, whether it's Corrections or the Douglas County uh, Health Center uh, or whether it's the Youth Center, we treat everyone with respect. And when you respect someone, uh, you act differently toward them and you, you do take care of them and that's what you've been doing in, a, in your staff. And I want to comment about uh, the last time we met, um, we had a group of uh, uh, black uh, employees come down and uh, spoke about what's going on at, at, at uh, the facility and your leadership and uh, you really are not giving lip service. And it's really important that we, uh, we come up with solutions and, uh, and really do real things about what's happened in our nation and around the world. So uh, I really commend you for that because uh, that you couldn't pull off. You had, to, you had to deliver or they wouldn't have said the things they did. So I'm really happy about that. Um, I did want to mention, um, let's see, the uh, people that we might have, I don't know, we don't have, have a report on it and I don't want to give you something more to do, but uh, I'm still very interested in what we can do about um, bail. And we're not letting out people that are have serious felonies or anything of that nature, but uh, people who are there and have low bail, you know, $500 or less or something, and they're sitting, sitting in custody and it's really uh, destroying what's left of their families if they have a family. So um, we need to start to focus, I think, on that again mm -hmm. and then, I did want to ask uh, Commissioner Borgerson if she would comment because it's another big item about our um, health care over there, the cost of it. And she's been very active in trying to um, get legislation on a federal level uh, because, and I want to ask her to explain it because she's much more adept at this and I don't want to misspeak. But um, it's really a crime what happens to people who are arrested and taken into a facility uh, like ours. Uh, Marianne, if you would, I think it'd be important that taxpayers are told about what happens to their Medicare and Medicaid and uh, government insurance and then uh, what takes place and what the National Association is trying to do to remedy it. It'd be helpful to know that, I think, if you wouldn't mind sometime. So, it, it, Regarding the bail yeah. um, issue, one of the other things that I, I did not include in my report is our, we had, we were pursuing a project um, actually with, with Harvard. Um, and some funders to do, they wanted to scientifically study bail funds and um, to see how people perform. Um, if, if, if they bail people out, how are they going to do and track them over the course of time compared to how people who aren't, uh, who are held in, in, uh, de in detention pretrial do. Um, that project, again, with the pandemic, was set aside for a little while. I just had a call with um, the, the contact person from Harvard last week. Um, the, it is still on track to move forward. Um, we don't have a hard start date or anything at this point, um, but there'll be, um, there will be a bail fund established um, okay. for use in Douglas County to fulfill this study. Okay. We are one of two sites. Um, they're doing this in, in San Antonio, um, and they're doing this in Douglas County. Good, that's great. Um, I, I do want to just briefly mention, if anyone's talking to our congressional candidates, uh, it'd be great if you could ask them how come 
uh, the federal government uh, strips health care from people who are arrested. So if you're arrested, uh, you go into our the facility, uh, you lose your federal insurance, whether it's Medicare or Medicaid, and then you have to apply for it all over again. And the financial impact of that is that you as taxpayers uh, are paying nearly, uh, well, I'm certainly over $5 million, closer to $6 million a year uh, to take care of the health needs of the inmates in that facility. And right now we have about 1,300. And so when you come in, when they come in, uh, I mean, uh, years ago, I remember we had to do a liver transplant. So, I mean, it's, it, that's a long time ago. We don't have that kind of extremes now, but it's really expensive and it's unnecessary and it's very vindictive to take away their health insurance when they are arrested. They're not found guilty, they're just arrested. So the light's flashing, so I'm gonna quit talking. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Thank, Thank you, you, Commissioner Boyle. Commissioner Borgeson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, we are working on that issue on the national level in terms of the Medicaid exclusion to where they would be able to keep their Medicaid benefits until um, they're sentenced. And that's moving um, quite nicely through the process, but of course, a lot of all what's happened here in our country has been, you know, our, our federal policy is really centered a lot on the, the COVID response um, rather than the other stuff. So, but we're still working on that. And um, it's, it's one again that, that is unfair because they haven't been uh, sentenced to what they were charged with, so they are pre-adjudicated. So we are trying to, to work on that. Thank you. May I speak? Uh, Commissioner Kraft. Yes. Uh, Mike, what, Mike Myers, what impact do you expect on our correctional facility when UNMC opens up their psych med, psych emergency psychiatric department? That, that, that's a very good question. And I, I don't know that I can predict that yet. Um, I think I need to learn a little bit more about what that facility, uh, the parameters of the, what that facility will, um, will bring. I, I certainly would, I can't predict that that'll result in a decrease in arrests, it may. Um, I think it, if there's somebody who, who has to come to jail but is also acutely mentally ill at the same time, um, at, at the very least that facility should allow some stabilization for that person prior to their arrival at corrections, which should make our admissions and intake process safer and less volatile. Um, and I would assume that hopefully that it will also bear out that during that time, um, I believe that's a 24-hour max maximum time that they can be present uh, in that facility, um, that other alternatives have an opportunity besides incarceration uh, to be explored during that time. So I, I would hope that it has a positive impact both in the uh, stability of the people who are being booked in if that has to be what happens and also um, diversion of individuals who um, may have another more pro appropriate alternative other than jail. Thank you, that's all I have. Thank you, Commissioner Kraft. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to um, add to that that I will be inviting uh, them to present to the board. Um, Region 6 has worked with them on this facility and we've worked for a number of years um, on it because we felt it was so important to have within our community. So we'll have them present um, to the board um, before they open. Thank you. Anything else for the Board of Corrections or for our director? If not, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. A motion and a second to adjourn of the Board of Corrections. Could we please vote? Uh, Commissioner Cavanaugh, I didn't capture your vote. Did you vote? It, it's uh, over. So, do you, you have a voice vote? Do you want to? I assume you vote yes. All right. Thank you. Very Motion good. passes six to zero. Thank you. We stand adjourned as the Board of Corrections and will now convene as the Board of Commissioners. Could we please start with the roll call? Commissioner Borgeson? Present. 
Commissioner Boyle? Here. Commissioner Cavanaugh? Here. Commissioner Morgan? Here. Commissioner Rogers? And Mr. Chair. Present. Thank you. Um, we have a very full agenda for the Board of Commissioners, and, and I apologize that we can't get to everybody first, but we can't. Uh, at about 10.10, I am expecting Dr. Gold to be calling in. Uh, last week, he, or two weeks ago, he shared with me a, a presentation, and, and I was so impressed with it, I said, can you please come Tuesday and share this with the board? He said, I have a tight schedule. I said, we'll work around your schedule. So when he calls in, I intend to go to Dr. Gold, and that should be in about 15 minutes. Um, having said that, I have also been requested to move up item G2A by Commissioner Rogers, um, and therefore, uh, we're going to start with that item. Item G2A, this is the resolution requesting the Nebraska legislature to support a ballot initiative to repeal the ban on affirmative action and employment and contracting in Nebraska's political subdivisions. Um, Mr. Chair, thank you. I'm coming up here because I have a visual that I need to put down to talk from. Yep. Where I'm putting it? Okay. This? I don't see the showing. Okay. So, Mr. Chair, I'm going to be I'm going to be very quick because this is pretty clear cut, and I'm per our conversation, I'm prepared to. Uh, table this uh, if Dr. Gold comes on and to pick it back up after he's there. Basically, the agenda item for the last six weeks um, after the George Floyd incident, I've had every, until a certain point for about two weeks, four to five messages every day from organizations uh, talking about their uh, disgust, concern, for the actions that happened. And incorporated in all of those actions were words that, quite frankly, were used more among the black community and communities of color than they were among the white community and the mainstream. Words like um, white privilege, white supremacy, structural change, um, reconstructing the system. Um, what basically I'm proposing today is all the actions that have been taken from people have said we are committing to reconstructing the system, to balancing and taking out the inequities that were there. Um, people have committed to that action. We committed to that as a board. A lot of bodies committed to that board, as a board. What I am um, asking the board to do is to consider approving a resolution to ask the legislature to put back on the ballot to reconsider the action taken in 2008, which when they approved Initiative 424. Um, basically, that initiative outlawed the discussion or the preference of talking about race when it came to employment, uh, contracting, scholarships, and education. And the bottom line is, for about the last eight weeks, we've been talking about race. So if we think it's not appropriate to talk about it in policy, then I think we're contradicting ourselves. Very quickly from this example, everything we've talked about to some degree, and I've asked um, the clerk to give this out to the public, and I think the example speaks for itself. The top piece with states, uh, I thought this was a good graph that came out immediately after this was over. The top piece, which is inequality is what everybody's been talking about weeks, the structural inequity that's been there for years, that's been trying to be corrected. The next piece talks about equality. And to me, if you don't take action to at least reset and have some new method by removing Initiative 424 out of the state statute, you can be equal all you want to, you do not correct the structural inequity that's already there. So you're gonna to have to have some intent. And that intent is what we have been talking about for the last six weeks when we say we're gonna to commit to leveling the field. 
Now, the next slide, which states which is equity, and you clearly see there's a higher ladder at some point than it is to balance out the structural inequity that's there. Lastly, you have what's evolved over the last point, which is justice. And justice is not only that, but some intentional action to level the field from there on. Basically, what I'm asking the body to do is support an effort to remove that language there to give us full, um, the full tools equitable to be able to address this issue in the long term. You can try to get at it, but as long as that is in the law, you're not going to be able to dig hard. Now, in closing, I have not talked to any of you about this other than giving you the resolution to know what it is, and my intent was not to talk to you about that. This is a matter that I think all of us have to look and see where we are at on this matter. And my ask is I just ask the conversations that we've been having to try to address this. I think this is a first step. There's been a lot of things floating around. I've, been, I've seen some language passed to me from people giving me a heads up about what's been said in respect to saying the reversing of this ballot, the, the reversing of this statute would be the equivalent to um, discrimination against whites, which I clearly do not understand. So only my ask is, I'm asking everybody, don't get caught up in the word affirmative action because the fact is the example that I just showed you is it no matter what you want to call it or not. I don't call if you I don't call if you tell, call it um, supportive activity. I don't care what you call it, but for us to be able to address it fully and with the full tools of the government, you cannot do that with the statute on the book. So that's my clear ask today. And we can know where we're at, you know, for the purpose of that. So I'm going to go back. Any other comments I'll have, I'll have them there. But I needed to show this visual, make sure everybody had it. This pretty much talks to where I'm at. I'm not asking to ask the legislature to insert a program. I'm asking the board to support the citizens getting another opportunity to vote on this language, because it's a whole different world now than it was in 08. So with that. Andrew. I'd, a, I'd like to ask for a motion and a second for discussion. If I, I may motion. comment. Yeah, that's my motion. One moment, Commissioner Kraft. I'll, I'll get to you in a moment. I'll make a motion. Well, I'll motion and a second. Right, we, we have a motion by Commissioner Rogers, a second by Commissioner Boyle. Uh, now, Commissioner Kraft. Yes, I can't. My vote won't count because I'm not there in person. But I want my constituents and the public to know that I support asking for a vote to rescind this legislation and take it out of the Constitution. It does not belong in our state Constitution. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Kraft. Other comments, questions? Larry Store, 5015 Lafayette Avenue, Omaha, Nebraska, 68132. This is all well and good. I uh, agree with a lot of what we've been hearing for the last six weeks, uh, eight weeks, I think he said. But you know, it hasn't been very many people that have been telling us that. We've been hearing it from the same people for this long period of time. Mr. Gray, Mr. Rogers. Let's be cautious. I remember going to work at Northwestern Bell just up the street here and being put through diversity training in the 70s, probably about 71. And ever since that time, that has been a federal law. We don't need another resolution, folks. We have a federal law. Maybe it only applies to corporations with 25 employees. But the intent of the federal law is no discrimination shape, size, color, or whatever. Now we've added almost the whole alphabet. So we don't need another one. This is all good, and it's pretty, and it's cute. But I don't need to be re-educated, and that's what's going on here. For two years I've been coming down here, and I've been hearing this type of thing for two years. It is a national agenda. We don't need a national agenda here. We need 
representatives that we elected. We don't need best practices from on high. We need best practices from Omaha. And I was in Memorial Park the other day, and the Black Lives Matters crowd that are youth, that are OPS students, et cetera, and the youth group announced last night, couldn't even respect the black speakers, the people of color that were speaking the other side of the argument. Didn't even respect them. They had to get up on the podium at the memorial and try to intermix and put their signs in front of people. That's not the way you do it. But they've been taught differently. Question is, at their young age, who is it that's been teaching them? It must not have been OPS. So let's temper it a little bit. Let's work together. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Other comments? W welcome, Councilman Gray. Thank you. Nice uh, to be with us this morning. Mr. Chair, uh, Commissioners, my name is Ben Gray. Uh, my address is 1819 Farnham, um, LC1 uh, in this county, uh, city county building. Uh, I'm here today in support of this resolution. Uh, we intend to, as a city council, we intend to, I intend to introduce this same le piece of legislation at our two o'clock meeting this afternoon because people say to me, elected officials say to me, people in the community says to me, everybody says, we want to have a frank and honest discussion. I'm going to see how much we want to have a frank and honest discussion. I'm going to see that because for me and for black folks in this community, we know that white people have had affirmative action since they've been in this country. From the days of the racist beginnings of the Davis-Bacon Act, and y'all need to understand, I'm a pro-union person, but the racist beginnings of the Davis-Bacon Act, where it said in its preamble, no black or other itinerant workers shall gain contracts with the federal government. That was the starting of it. Unions came in, moved black people out all over the country. In the 1890s, we had the, the majority of individuals who were riding horses, black jockeys. They were like nine out of 10 of the individual jockeys all around this country. By 1930, there was one because unions moved them out. In 1968, the Federal Housing Administration, the president of that at the time, or the, the, the secretary at that time said, and said very proudly, that as we were building suburbs and various other places for whites to move to, to get away from the black community, this man said in public very proudly that the Federal Housing Administration made sure that no black individuals were going to be in any of those suburbs around this country. You've had affirmative action since the beginning. Since the beginning. And what we're asking for is to level the playing field. You heard your uh, individual who runs your, 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 commit, your jail here. Let's say, for example, someone gets a burr up their cells and they say, we're going to file a legal action against what he's doing because it's a violation of that law that's on the books in Lincoln. If they file that legal action, what's going to be our response? What are we going to do? The fact of the matter is, and I know that there are some people in here that are going to be under pressure to vote no, and I get it. I understand the politics of this. So there are going to be people that are going to say, vote no. And I'm going to understand that, but the people that are asking you to vote no, what are they prepared to do? Have you asked that question? When they say, don't vote for this because this is unfair and reverse discrimination, but if you know that white people have had affirmative action since the day they've been here, what's going to be our response? And, when we, and those people that tell us to vote no, what are they prepared to do to level the playing field, if anything? Or are they prepared to say the status quo is fine with us? We're going to have some significant discussion, some serious discussion. We're going to put some things on the table. And sometimes people in this room and others are not going to like it. But if we're going to have a serious, ongoing, meaningful discussion, we have to look at this painful past and decide what we're going to do. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilman Gray. With apologies, 
we're, we're, we're going to okay. change directions for a minute. You'll get an opportunity. I'll make sure, but it's not going to be for a few minutes. Mr. Chair, I'd ask to table um, this item until after item 5C and to be brought up after, five, uh, after item 5C is done. I'd make that motion. All right. Uh, motion and a second to table this to hear Dr. Gold's report, and then we will come back to it. Could we please vote on that motion? Uh, give me a moment. You, you need Ellen's flying fingers up there, Dan. <laughs> Once Dr. Gold starts speaking, he'll take the screen. Good morning, Dr. Gold. Can you hear us? Yes, I can. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for joining us this morning. Two weeks ago, Dr. Gold gave a quick presentation to me. I was not set up for Zoom, and so I wasn't able to see the visuals, but I was so captured by what he had to say, I said, can you come back to the next county board meeting and share this with the whole board? So that's why we're here this morning. Welcome, Dr. Gold. Thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure. So uh, may I share the screen and uh, would that be appropriate? I think you've got it, yes. Thank you. All through the power of Zoom, right? <laughs> what did we ever do without it? Don't answer that question. <clears throat> so first of all, I just want to thank you for the opportunity. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Jeff Gold and I have the honor serving as the chancellor of the Med Center and also as the chancellor of the University of Nebraska at Omaha. You also probably know I am not a Nebraskan by birth, but I am definitely a Nebraskan by choice, and I'm very proud of that fact. What I've asked to do is uh, to put together a brief update and presentation on what we affectionately here call the NEXT project, which stands for Nebraska Transformation. And uh, I will share this uh, entire slide deck immediately upon completion uh, with you. My idea here was simply run through about 20 or 25 minutes of a status background uh, on this, and then to allow as much time as you wish today for, uh, uh, for your questions. And I look forward to continuing this dialogue uh, with the County Board of Commissioners and appreciate the uh, uh, invitation uh, by Commissioner Duda. So uh, what I'm gonna be talking about is probably not new to you, these are just some of the headlines that over the last uh, year have uh, populated some of the local media. There's a whole other set of headlines that have populated other national media uh, regarding the uh, magnitude and the nature and the rationale uh, behind the project that, uh, that I'm uh, gonna be talking about. But I'm sure most of you are well aware uh, is that the Med Center main campus, which is located on uh, uh, 42nd Street uh, between uh, Leavenworth and Dodge uh, continues to expand. It's broken into three different zones. It's broken into an educational zone, which is the most eastern part of the campus, a pure research zone, which is in the western part of the campus. And then the central part uh, consists of the teaching, the clinical teaching part, meaning the hospitals, clinics, and uh, other related uh, outpatient facilities, uh, et cetera. And so that's been historically the layout for a very, very long time with the average facility age uh, of the clinical teaching sites of the university uh, between 50 and 70 years. So currently, as of you know, last year, uh, this most recent data, just over 4,000 students, learners, uh, nearly 600 residents, uh, 80 high school students in the High School Alliance program Last year, we did 138 million in extramurally funded research. That number is going to exceed 160 million as of last June 30th. 38 or uh, 37 research centers, core labs, the clinical facilities uh, of the Med Center here last year did uh, just over 38,000 inpatient visits, uh, over a million unique outpatient visits, uh, 95,000 ER visits 
and practicing in over 77 different clinical sites in a multi-state region. Uh, economic impact of $4.8 billion with an aggregated budget of $2.5 billion a year, 42,000 direct and indirect jobs. So just in case you're wondering, an indirect job is when we contract with a consulting firm, a food service firm, an environmental services firm to provide services. <clears throat> and in aggregate, in all of the campuses of the Med Center, uh, just over uh, 12.8 million square feet. So a large uh, clinical, educational, and research enterprise, but also a major driver of the economy for our communities. The so-called NEXT project, the Nebraska Transformation Project, is aimed at, uh, at two different distinct uh, profiles. While most importantly, it's to increase the education and to increase the number of physicians, pharmacists, dentists, therapists, others, nurses, uh, to support our community, given the shortages that we are currently seeing to improve the learning environment, to link to the Davis Global Center, to dramatically expand clinical trial activity, develop statewide networks, co-locate clinical and research activities, and then to meet the growing clinical inpatient and outpatient care needs, which are rapidly changing for Nebraska and the multi-state region that we serve, to recruit faculty and new programs, to improve the patient experience in some of our very old facilities, and then to add operational facilities around quality and safety, to reduce the cost of delivery of care, which is staffing issues, and to avoid renovation and, uh, and energy costs. You may also know uh, that approximately two years ago, we broke ground uh, for the new uh, Monroe Meyer Institute, uh, which is our developmental and intellectual disabilities program, uh, which is going to be housed on Pine Street on the Exarban campus uh, in a former FDR facility. That building will open uh, in uh, early spring of 2021, uh, less than six months from now, uh, approximately or almost exactly six months from now, which will free a seven acre site, just to give you some orientation, uh, on the corner of Saddle Creek uh, and Farnham. And uh, that location is the most prime site uh, to do what is contemplated in, in the next project. This is part of a much larger facility master plan, and I won't bore you with the details during this presentation, but this has to do with the commercialization and renovation of 28 acres west of Saddle Creek. And you get a preliminary look here at what some of the road systems will look like, more research space as we're currently out of research space with rapidly growing extramurally funded research. And by the way, every million dollars of research is uh, 33 high paying jobs. And so uh, this is as much a educational research and clinical program, but even more so an economic development program. But just to get you oriented, uh, uh, this would be uh, Saddle, the existing Saddle Creek. Uh, this is uh, the existing 42nd Street here. And in the blue, you're seeing the location of the planned next project, uh, which is going to be a multi-tower, uh, multi-pavilion, uh, 2.6 or 2.7 million square feet uh, location. This is just an artist's rendering, just to give you a little bit of perspective here. Uh, so you're looking down Saddle Creek from the south to the north. So to your far right here would be where the Cancer Center is and the Kaneko uh, Tower. Uh, to your far left, you're looking on the other side of Saddle Creek with new offices, parking, mixed retail and residential space. Uh, this is the so-called Saddle Creek Lid project, which is a separate project. And then in the far distance here in light blue, you're seeing the location of the next and this would you're seeing just the edge of Farnham there. So uh, this project has been ongoing in planning for many years, actually more than five years. However, it became very obvious that it is a confluence of time and space. And what I mean by that is that as a result of one of our 37 research centers, which is known as the UNMC Global Center for Health Security, we have had now for many years, more than uh, a decade, but most recently since 2014 and the explosion of the Ebola pandemic in Western Africa, multiple public-private partnerships through the Global Center for Health Security, which is referred to as the GCHS, 
uh, with the federal government, particularly around Health and Human Services, CDC, ASPR, FDA, BARDA, and the National Defense Medical Service System, and particularly with the Department of Defense, which of course includes Strategic Command, includes the Joint Chiefs, and particularly the Defense Health Agency, and very close ties with Homeland Security, Department of State, and add to that the VA and many Department of Transportation and many other federal agencies and departments. But these are very broad and very deep multi-million dollar contractual task orders that the GCHS has been responsible for now going back uh, for the last seven years. One of the things the GCHS does, the Global Center, is it tracks all of these emerging uh, diseases. So, you know, everything from dengue fever to Zika virus to yellow fever, Marburg, we're looking at another outbreak in the Congo of uh, Ebola right now, uh, but also is very interested in chemical, biological, radiation, and nuclear, and actually environmental injury as well. To give you an example of that, there are 28,500 American service uh, members uh, in South Korea. If they had either an accidental or a non-accidental chemical biological or nuclear exposure, how would they be repatriated, how would that be handled, et cetera. And that's the kind of work that we do. But most recently, the focus of the GCHS uh, has not been on uh, dengue fever or Zika, but it's been on COVID-19 and the virus that causes it, which is called SARS-CoV-2. And without boring you, <clears throat> the center is interested in everything from the patterns of the virus itself to transmission test development, surveillance, quarantine, isolation, biocontainment, antivirals, uh, data analytics, modeling, advocacy, playbooks, mobile apps, advising, consulting, and communication. Indeed, the earned media from the GCHS in the last six months has exceeded $3 billion of earned media just for the work that's been going on with uh, COVID-19. So the, we had and I personally had the opportunity to work very closely with the National Academy of Science and the Department of Health and Human Services during this session, uh, which was conducted, this is exactly a year ago, almost to the day, uh, called Enhancing Private Sector Readiness for 21st Century Threats. And this is the publication that came out of this, which I did not write, but it was published in the Journal of the American Association last year. <laughs> And it starts off with the very first sentence, is not since the threat of global nuclear war first emerged has human faced the risks of potential disasters at the scale that the 21st century brings. Both the federal government and many local United States have made substantial progress in preparing for mass casualty events. However, however, at this point, the US healthcare system is wholly unprepared for a wide range of 21st century threats. It lacks the will coordinative mechanisms, habits of cooperation, governance agreements, and shared resource investments essential for preparedness. And it concludes with the sentence that progress will require unprecedented participation and contribution from an enormous range of stakeholders, including government, nonprofit, private sectors, and professionals involved in all facets of healthcare. Understand that this was written before the first case of COVID was ever diagnosed. Uh, and just an amazing uh, projection and prediction of what we all knew was going to be true. But as a direct result of that, uh, we've been working very closely with the federal government now for over two years in a public-private hybrid project uh, that has been popularized in the local media that would be a combination of the needs of the Med Center uh, to increase our clinical teaching space to remove antiquated facilities that are more than 75 years of age that would cost uh, 800 million dollars to uh, renovate over what would require a 24-year period in partnership with the federal government so think of this as a hybrid project owned partly by uh, the federal government partly by uh, the university that would be scaled to accommodate the needs. And the idea is pretty simple, is that this would be a combination of approximately 1.5 million square feet dedicated uh, to the Med Center, 880,000 square feet dedicated to this public-private partnership, a modular component 
and then a private sector component that would deal completely with parking, office, residential, retail, uh, and utilities. The totality is estimated to be approximately 1,200 beds, but would also consist of inpatient, outpatient space, security space, testing space, et cetera. Indeed, it's been hypothesized that if five or more of these centers existed in the United States, we could have completely prevented the spread of COVID-19 across the country, which has been utilized in other parts of the world. I, it should not be lost on you that just for the core project alone, we're talking something in the vicinity of 2.8 to $3.1 billion, 50 million additional dollars for the modular and about $320 million, if not more, actually current estimates are as high as 600 million for the private sector investments in the parking office, utilities, uh, and uh, retail sectors of the project. A huge economic project spanning well over uh, 2.6 million square feet. We are currently anticipating uh, a federal uh, component uh, that would consist of both the National Defense Authorization Act funding, and I'm gonna give you the details on this in a minute, and then COVID-19 funding you're probably well aware of LB 1084. We are anticipating participation, at least at some level, by county and city, as well as significant participation by the private sector <clears throat> in philanthropy foundations and the local and national businesses, as well as some debt service uh, that would need to uh, go into this uh, long term. So just to tell you, this is the list of the federal agencies and departments that we are currently working with on this project. However, the core are the United States Congress, Health and Human Services, Defense, and directly with the White House. So last December, the United States Congress and the President signed into law the National Defense Authorization Act for 2020. And I'm not gonna read these slides to you. They're all in the brief. But Section 740 is to create a pilot program uh, um, on civilian military partnerships uh, to enhance interoperability and medical surge capacity. It authorized the Secretary of Defense to conduct this pilot program in no less than five years in, co in collaboration <clears throat> with the VA, HHS, Homeland Security, and Transportation. It's one of these very, very unique projects, and it requires the SecDef to have completed the initial pilot program planning in 180 days which would have been, by the way, uh, June 30th, but because of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, this has been delayed. We anticipate this will be completed over the summer, if not in the very early fall. However, in the 2021 NDAA, uh, this is the Senate version. This is Senate Bill number 40-49, uh, uh, which uh, was just completed last week uh, by the uh, uh, committee of the, uh, of the United States Senate, led, by the way, by Senator Fisher and others, to require the uh, Second Secretary of Defense for uh, Health Affairs, affectionately known as the DHA, to lead the design <clears throat> to carry out the pilot program in not fewer than five locations <clears throat> in the United States that are located at or near established expertise in disaster preparedness and response to trauma. And indeed, these are the qualifications listed here. <clears throat> Existing academic medical centers, institutions of higher education with established expertise in highly infectious disease, biocontainment, quarantine, trauma care, combat casualty care, uh, active contracts with the uh, NDMS, disaster health preparedness and response, medical public health management of biological, chemical, radiologic, and nuclear hazards, and give priority to public-private partnerships with academic medical centers of institutions of higher education, hospitals, and entities with facilities with underscore and establish history. Let's just back up to that. An established history of providing clinical care, treating, training, and research in the areas described above. Uh, there is exactly one institution in the United States that has the qualifications for that, and I happen to be sitting uh, uh, right in the middle of it as I speak to you. This initial report with the collect selection of locations for the pilot program has to be completed in 180 days of the passage of this bill. 
and the final report has to be completed of the pilot program under subsection one uh, by the Senate Armed Services Committee uh, and the House of Representatives. This is the House bill known as the Military Medical Surge Capacity Partnership, it's section 744 of the House bill. And again, this came out of the uh, Armed Services Committee uh, of the House and they provide to the Secretary of Defense a uh, mandate to accelerate the commencement of the pilot program and identify the pilot sites. The committee directs the Secretary to work expeditiously to collaborate with the National Disaster Medical System. This is the exact language out of the House uh, NDAA. Again, it mirrors almost exactly, it's slightly different format, but it mirrors almost exactly what the United States Senate did and this will be voted on by both houses no later than next week. But were that not enough, these are the four bills that the United States Congress has passed regarding uh, coronavirus supplemental. I'm going to draw your attention to the first one, H.R. 6074, which appropriated $8.3 billion, and H.R. 748, which appropriated $2.2 trillion, effectively known as the CARES bill, the Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security Act. In 6074, uh, there is language here and appropriation directly for NETEC, which is a National Ebola Special Pathogens Training and Education Center, which is housed here at the Med Center, but also has specific funding for planning the capacity to supply an increase in biocontainment beds at additional healthcare facilities. These are the $150 million of planning money for the next process. We were then asked to submit a uh, requirement list of what we would need to expend $150 million for this project planning. And this is an outline of the categories in a 100-page document that was sent to ASPR to tell them what exactly we would do with $150 million of planning money. However, very importantly, in HR 748, in the Department of Defense is $1.5 billion that was worked here by our federal delegation uh, to expand military hospitals and expeditionary hospital packages to alleviate anticipated strain on both military and civilian health care funds to nearly triple the 4,300 beds available in military facilities today, i.e., that's the $1.5 billion for the federal component of the construction of this project. In addition, there's labor HHS language that not only provides additional money to the NETEC, the National Ebola Special Pathogens Training and Education Center, and to increase medical surge capacity on both sides. This is just a brief reminder for me to comment uh, on to LB 1084, which of course is the state uh, bill, which is called the Nebraska Transformational Project Act introduced on January 21st by Senator Mark Coulterman. <clears throat> there are over 40 signatures currently on this bill, and as my understanding, this bill is going to be finalized and voted on during the upcoming final sessions of the Nebraska Unicameral. This is a very busy slide. I'm not going to walk you through it, but just to make the point that this is at least a five-year project, and there's a lot of active planning and research, site preparation, uh, business development that's going on as we speak. This is going to be overseen by a 501c3 known as the next DC or the next development corporation. The reason for that is that we have taken the very best of the model that built the Fred and Pamela Buffett Cancer Center, which was called the CCDC. Uh, uh, the Cancer Center, as you probably know, sits on dirt owned by the university. All of the buildings are owned by the university and clinical space is leased to Nebraska Medicine and to others uh, as necessary. The VA ambulatory care model, which was created by the CHIP-IN bill, you're probably aware of that as well, is also a 501c3. As a matter of fact, the board on which I sit on actually meets later this afternoon. We're gonna have a ribbon cutting in the not so distant future and hand this back to the VA. So it is a hybrid of these two 501c3s that has created the governance structure, which I won't bore you of, of this freestanding independent next development corporation, which is a direct uh, spinoff from the University of Nebraska uh, Board of Regents, uh, which will oversee the construction, uh, the con contracting architecture 
uh, for this project uh, over the next what is going to come down to almost a decade. This is a screenshot from the Trip Umbach report, which was finished in December. At that time, the core project was estimated to be <laughs> $2.6 billion. Uh, they came up with three different models anticipating economic impact, a average model, an extreme model, and then a minimal model. The numbers I'm sharing with you here are the minimal model that this third party firm uh, identified. Overall economic impact during the 10 year period of construction, 7.6 billion and an additional 1.9 billion per year following completion of the project. 41,000 construction jobs, again, 41,000 during the decade with 8.1 thousand incremental jobs to the Med Center with a total tax, state tax revenue during the construction period of $212 million and a minimum of $50 million per year enduring revenue uh, to the state. So I showed you this slide earlier, but if you would bring this up to the 10 year point from when this study was done in 2028, we will have increased the student production of doctors, nurses, pharmacists, dentists, therapists, et cetera, to almost 5,000 students. That's an increase of 800 students, 25% increase in residents, nearly doubling our research funding, significant increases in inpatient and outpatient care, bringing the total med center budget to 3.5 billion, the annual economic impact to $6.7 billion a year, taking us not during construction, but following construction to 51,000 direct and indirect jobs and bringing the campus on 42nd Street from 12.8 to 16.1 million square feet. And so the reason that I'm so interested in spending time with the commissioners today is just to make sure that you are aware of this, give you an opportunity for follow-up either now or with a uh, later time in the future. And of course, for your advocacy to understanding the complexity of the funding sources and also the complexity of the planning process and scope, site, uh, timeline, uh, et cetera. So I am very willing and eager to take your questions, thoughts, suggestions. And of course, I would leave you with the thought, this is much more than just infrastructure. This is how we are going to build the future for healthcare, build the reputation of the Med Center uh, for uh, an all hazard disaster uh, system, and uh, hopefully uh, dramatically increase the economic prosperity of, uh, of our community uh, for a decade to come. And by the way, given the fact that this has to be in proximity uh, to a United States Air Force facility, this will permanently seal the fate for Offit for decades and decades to come. And so with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I, I'm grateful for this opportunity and I'm willing to take, of course, any questions that you may have now or at any time in the future. Thank you, Dr. Gold. Uh it's almost overwhelming uh, what, what is coming up, and this is why I was so anxious to have you share this with the board and, and the public. Uh, this is truly exciting and, and um, carries a great deal of weight in the future of our community, I, I, I think. I couldn't be more excited about where, where you're going with this. Commissioner Kavanaugh. Thank you. Um, Thanks for this, uh, Doctor. It's interesting. Uh, could you send us a copy? We didn't get any of the backup on your presentation at all. We have like a one-page announcement that, that you were going to address us here. Could you send yes, us sir, what you I just... I will send uh, to your offices a, uh, the PDF of this entire deck that I just shared. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Other Commissioner Boyle. Dr. Gold, first of all, this is Mike Boyle. I really... Uh, appreciate your leadership. We're so fortunate to have you here. So I just want to say that at the outset, uh, your leadership is just indispensable. Uh, I, uh, of course, I saw the list that some of the uh, contributors are going to be uh, the city and the county and so forth. Um, is it appropriate for uh, a question about what kind of participation financially you expect the county to do and, and the length of it and so forth? Is that something you'd be willing to talk about now? Uh, we haven't really thought it through because uh, we are to, to give you an exact moment in time, I probably spend two hours a day on either a Zoom call or a phone call, 
either with the West Wing of the White House, with the Department of Defense or Health and Human Services. And the totality of the scope of the project has yet to be determined. In other words, how many beds, how many clinics, how much laboratory testing space they want. And, and that relates to the fact that the 180-day study uh, being done by Defense Health Affairs has not been completed. I should have had that information by the end of June, but because of COVID-19, I don't have it. Until we have that, uh, I really don't know uh, what the ask will be. We've had several meetings uh, with uh, the mayor and several meetings with the planning board as actually recently as last week, because as you might imagine, we're talking about significant road and utility changes uh, and things of that nature. We've had several meetings with the private sector who are going to do uh, both parking and, uh, and uh, utilities and hopefully an office building or two and maybe another hotel, uh, all of which will be Skywalk connected. And then, of course, a, a lot is going to depend on the, the philanthropic sector. And, you know, I've got handshake agreements, let's just say, for many hundreds of millions of dollars uh, from the private sector who will be the naming donors for the multiple towers of this uh, new uh, facility. Uh, so uh, it's a very exciting time. Uh, you know, I, I would, I'd love to come back at a later time, of course, when I have a little bit more concrete numbers. Uh, you know, if the county would like to do the totality of the project, we'd be very grateful <laughs> yep. for that. But short of that, I'm sure we can come up with a, a reasonable plan for the future. Well, I, I would like to do the totality, but there's some <laughs> laughter when you said that, so but thank you. No, doctor, I just, I, I don't mean to even suggest that we have any reluctance. I mean, on my part, this is, uh, I've heard about this coming and I really, uh, I'm very excited about it. I think this is a real, uh, just a, an incredible opportunity and uh, thank you for bringing it to us. Yes, thank you so much, Commissioner Borgeson. Hi, Dr. Gold, this is uh, Commissioner Marianne Borgeson and thank you for the presentation today on this and it is exciting and it is the uh, future of our health care that excites me about it. Um, I also want to tell you that back in December when we had a couple hundred folks from across the country here um, that actually went through a couple of the facilities at UNMC, um, they were actually really jealous of us to have such a phenomenal institution right in the middle of um, everything and um, and very impressed with everything and so this just adds to that impressiveness of your vision for UNMC so I thank you for that and look forward to future conversations thank you I appreciate that commissioner and I might add which I, I should have added earlier that as you probably know the United States Congress is working on another COVID bill right now and we are actively involved. We, we literally help the committees craft the language, and that is going to be even more specific uh, regarding the planning and the modular components of this uh, project. So it, this be increasingly becomes a reality on a day-by-day -day basis. It is an amazing thing. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time to share with us this morning, Dr. Gold. This is exciting, and I hope you will uh, keep us in the loop as this project moves forward, that we will have an Any time, and if there are, you know, members of the board or community members that are involved that would like more information, everybody knows how to reach me. I'd be honored to uh, provide it. And uh, is there a particular, uh, I guess my office must know who to send the deck to, right? Karen Cole, yes. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll do that uh, within the hour. Very good. Thank you so much, Dr. Gold. All right, appreciate Thank you. your I'm time. I'm gonna sign off if that's okay. Yep. I have to go raise some money, right? <laughs> very good, very good. <laughs> Thank you, bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gold. Okay, I, I uh, appreciate everybody's uh, flexibility and accommodating him on his busy schedule. We will now uh, come back to the issue that we were discussing uh, prior to that, and that is, uh, Miss, Mr. Chair, if I may just note for the record, we actually never voted on that motion to table, uh, which is unnecessary at this point, I guess, but just wanted yeah, to yeah, bring late, that up. A little so. late now. Okay, right. so we never tabled it, so we're still there. Uh, Commissioner Rogers, I turn the floor back to you. What, what, um, there were Miller testimony. Okay, excuse me. 
I apologize for the interruption. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I am Vicki Young, president of the Omaha branch of the NAACP, 2221 North 24th Street, 68110. Our mission of the NAACP is to secure the political, educational, uh, social, and economic equality of rights in order to eliminate race discrimination, race-based discrimination, and ensure the health and well-being of all persons. In 2008, the Nebraska State Legislature adopted a ban on affirmative action related to employment and contracting in Nebraska political bodies. The ban has perpetuated disparities, racial injustice, and systematic racism in our state and represents a barrier to improving diversity, inclusion, and in equity at local government and community levels. As part of the commitment to racial justice and active engagement um, in anti-racism, rejecting the hierarchy of racist policy, the Omaha branch of the NAACP uh, and the Omaha Community Council for Racial Justice and Reconciliation support efforts to repeal the ban on affirmative action, which would be a step towards progress in doing away with structures, upholding and perpetuating systemic racism. We support today's resolution. During this critical moment in the movement, uh, the Omaha NAACP and OCCRJR uh, will um, not only work with co-collaborators to engage and lobby state legislature until the repeal is made, but we will also educate the community on the significance of the resolution, this particular resolution, and the repeal of the ban on affirmative action. And so again, I'm here to say that on behalf of the Omaha NAACP as the president, we support today's resolution. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate your comments, Vicki. Would anybody else like to address this issue? Just knock me over. Good morning, Chairman Duda, Good members morning. of the Douglas County Board of Commissioners. My name is Brenda Council. I reside at 1615 Work, and I come before you today in support of this resolution. Uh, recent events have illuminated this country's shameful history of racial injustice and systemic racism. And people need to understand what systemic racism is. Systemic racism is a reflection of public policies and institutional practices that work in various and often reinforcing ways to perpetuate racial group inequities. And we have been faced with, presented vividly with examples of inequity toward African Americans uh, in this country. Indeed, when we talk about racial inequity and what is at the root of it, author and professor Ibram X. Kendi has written that Racial inequity is a problem of bad policy, not bad people. So what we need to do is address the policies that perpetuate racial inequity in this country. The state constitutional amendment prohibiting affirmative action is a glaring example of public policy that not only calls, but in fact justify an inequitable distribution of rights, opportunities, and experiences. And for those who don't understand why it is that a ban on affirmative action actually justifies inequity, is that the inequity arises from the fact that we have taken action through public policy and practice that has based opportunities penalties on the basis of the color of one's skin. And for us to believe that we can redress those inequities without taking into account the color of one's skin is absurd because the very basis of the inequity is the color of one's skin. The anti-affirmative action policy prohibits this body and any other governmental body I listened to the director of the county Department of Corrections talk about their strategic plan to address inequality. And I sat there and I said, how do you expect to do that 
when the people who have been victimized by this inequality have been victimized on the basis of the color of their skin, yet you cannot fashion plans and actions that take into account that reality, because this constitutional amendment prohibits you from doing that. I just listened to Dr. Gold's presentation, and I'd listened to it in the context of a few weeks ago, the Douglas County Board of Health passing a resolution declaring racism as a public health crisis. And one of the issues that was addressed in that resolution was the fact that there is inequitable access to health care in this county, and that's not uncommon. That's the case throughout this country. Yet I watched Dr. Gold's presentation, and he talked about how he was going to increase the number of students on the campus at UNMC, how he's going to increase the number of residents on the campus of UNMC. How many of those residents are going to be African American or other people of color who have been deprived and denied an equitable opportunity to achieve a medical or a health care education? It is for these reasons that I stand before you today and ask you that if you are really serious, really serious about taking action that will improve diversity, inclusion, and equity, you must be willing to do away with the structures that only serve to uphold and perpetuate this system of inequity. So I ask that you adopt this resolution as a first step in our effort to provide for the equity that's reflected in this chart that Commissioner Rogers passed out. And I really ask you to focus your attention on equity. Because you see, one ladder is taller than the other. It has to be. And it says you must have custom tools that identify and address inequality. You can't address an inequality that's based on the color of skin without taking into account the color of skin. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda. Anybody else have any comments to share? Good morning. Good morning, Commissioner Duda and all other commissioners on the board. My name is Jasmine Harris, address 5014 Pratt Street. I'm here today in a personal capacity. Um, I want to take into account when we talk about trying to increase access for people of color and how the government can fit in that. And I start thinking about the REACH program at the city level um, when we're talking about small businesses and construction and increasing the resources for those small businesses owned by people of color and what can we do when we're looking at the contracting process and a lot of those contracts have to be uh, include businesses owned by people of color. So if that's the case, then it should not be an issue to pass a resolution to get the state to fall into line as well with those things that we're trying to work on. All systems have disproportionately affected black and brown bodies specifically. And in order to begin moving the resolution that was passed by the Board of Health um, to declare racism as a public health crisis, this resolution is another step in the right direction. Affirmative action was yanked out from under Nebraskans using deceptive language in the petition process and using someone from out of state to infiltrate communities of color to get them to sign it. Uh, that was 2008, I was in grad school and I remember being on the campus of UNO and seeing people with those petitions coming around using language that was like it didn't make any sense. The advocate and activist community was slightly different then than it is now and battling schemes like this was a huge undertaking. There's more unity than ever before between people who are diverse in age, race, gender, sexual orientation, religion, and more. There was a testifier earlier that spoke um, that only people who have been saying this are the same individuals. I'm here to ensure you that there are way more people who are ready to organize and mobilize around these issues and inequities and eradicate them. Removing legislative and organizational policy barriers begin to clear the path 
so that this work can be elevated to the next level to create real and sustainable change that we want to see in our city. There are many analogies that have gone around that talks about um, and illustrate the issue with systemic, systematic, and institutional racism. And there's been one recent one that I've heard and um, it really sinks in. And it talks about the groundwater. If you have one fish dead in the lake, then it's probably an issue with the fish. If you have a whole, if you have half the uh, population of fish dead in the lake, then you have to start looking at the lake. Now, if you address the lake and then the rest of those fish die after you address the issue, then you have to start looking at what toxicity has seeped into the groundwater. And this is one step in that direction when we are talking about removing that ban from affirmative action. Uh, Ms. Brenda Council spoke that eloquently when we have to really start looking at the policies and the barriers that have been put in place intentionally to keep people of color from progressing. And in order to remedy that, we have to move in that same direction in which it was addressed. And with that, I am putting in my support, and I know there are way more who wish they could be here at this time to give their support for this resolution to pass. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hurts. Would anybody else like to share? Hi, I'm Amanda Brewer, CEO of Habitat for Humanity in Omaha, address 1701 North 24th Street, Omaha, Nebraska, 68110. Um, I am here in also support of the repeal. I wasn't intending on testifying, but after these eloquent um, folks have spoken, and I'm not going to be able to be as eloquent because I'm not prepared, but uh, as a white ally, I want, um, I want the community and the, the board to know that uh, the time has come for justice, as um, Commissioner Rogers said. Uh, I have seen firsthand, and it's not that long ago, uh, the injustice in um, the employee, uh, employment world. I worked at a headhunter uh, in 1995, which is not that long ago, and uh, I was the lowest man on the totem pole and was instructed to mark the resume if I could tell the person was black so that they did not put those resumes forward to the employers. And uh, I soon left that company, but this is not that long ago. Um, in more recent years, I've had our Habitat homeowners say to me that they're not getting um, job interviews, and I said, uh, take the address off, uh, the North Omaha address, and put a different address on, and they did see success. Um, the time has come for a change, and it, it would be everyone's wish that we didn't need affirmative action, but we do, and so I'm here um, to support the repeal for 24. Thank you, Ms. Hurts. Anybody else? All right, we have a Oh, one more, two. Good morning. Good morning. Willie Barney, 12333 Cumming Street. Um, I want to first of all thank the commissioners for taking this up uh, for consideration. I want to thank Commissioner Rogers for making the bold move and making a leadership uh, statement. And I encourage the county commissioners uh, to continue your example of leadership. Uh, the Board of Health, not too long ago, uh, took a bold step and acknowledged that uh, racism is a public health crisis. I just want to say to you that it's going to take bold moves. As Senator Council mentioned, the way that we got here was policy. In many cases, very bad policy that has had a detrimental impact on African Americans and people of color. Um, I've been in the city for 20 years, have been dedicating most of my last 15 years to trying to work with collaborative groups to address these issues. And there's no doubt that collectively we have made some progress, but being reminded by the youth of our community, our sons and daughters, that the progress is not fast enough and it's not enough. I sat um, watching the last 20 minute presentation from Dr. Gold and I wasn't going to say anything about it because I'm in support of what UNMC does and have partnered with UNMC incredible in different ways. But to speak for 25 minutes about a multi-billion dollar project and not mention the biggest issue outside of the pandemic that we're addressing here in this country right now. I didn't hear any mention of racial diversity in contracting, racial diversity in employment, racial diversity in scholarships, racial diversity in any way mentioned in that presentation. And I think that is symptomatic of what's happening in our state, in our country, and in our city right now. It has to be intentional. 
we have to be intentional about addressing this. When we started this process 15 years ago, the prison population in the state of Nebraska was around 23, 24%, it's now 25%. So in that particular case, when it comes to sentencing, uh, when it comes to incarceration, we know that we have not moved the dial in that case. When we look at the tremendous work that your director at the Douglas County Jail has done uh, in preventing the spread of uh, the virus, and he has done an amazing job, but he stands before us and said that he wants to address diversity and inclusion. What tools will this commissioner office, your board, what tools will you be able to implement to directly target where the issue is? When we hear and we know and we acknowledge that African Americans provided 250 years of free labor to this country, and beyond that, another 100 years of disproportionate segregation, systemic oppression, we have to address the racial issue that we all acknowledge, and the way that it has to happen is you must be very intentional. I stand in support of the repeal of this ban, and I encourage this board of commissioners to lead by example, to be the first body in the state to say that we are going to intentionally address this head on, because that is the only way that it will be addressed. We greatly appreciate your support and look forward to the fact that you will be the leading public entity to take the first step, followed by the city, followed by the state, to say that we are the city on the hill, that in the state of Nebraska, we are going to address systemic racism once and for all. And in order to do that, it will take programs, projects, funding, policies that will finally reverse 400 plus years of racism that we all know has existed. So I really appreciate this board, the work that you've done. It's now time to accelerate it. I've heard from our youth uh, consistently and their voice is strong. If you look back a few weeks, it was white, black, Hispanic, Asian on the streets of, of Omaha, on the streets of this nation saying that Progress is not happening quick enough. There must be a sense of urgency. And I'm prayerful that this board will send the message to the entire state that now is our time to fix this. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Commissioner Rogers, for being bold enough to put this on the agenda. Thank you to the board of Douglas County for taking it forward. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Bernie. Appreciate your comments. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Candace Price. Uh, address is 6005 Sorensen Parkway. I'm a business owner in this community in Douglas County. I'm a parent, I'm a friend, and I'm a mentor. I 100% support this initiative that Chris Rogers has put forward, and I applaud him uh, for stepping out on faith and realizing and recognizing that his fellow board members will support him in this initiative as well. At least I believe that's what will occur and should occur. With everything that's going on and all of the social unrest and injustice that has always occurred in this country, but is being brought to light more now thanks to technology and cell phone video, I always hear a lot about, well, and this is from my white counterparts, it's not our fault, we didn't do it, we didn't cause this, we weren't around when the system was started. If I were back then, if things were back then, this is what I would do. Well, here's your opportunity to really show what you would do to really show how you would feel, to really step forward and show the world, our county, our city, the state, how you feel and how you would represent your community. Whether this initiative is needed or not is evident in every area of our county. Take a look at your board. Does your board makeup really represent this county? We have one person of color on the board. Come back this afternoon to the city council meeting. Take a look at that board. Does that represent this city? Unfortunately, it doesn't. I went down, I was down with the Liquor Control Commission last week for the state of Nebraska. There's not one person of color. You're going to find that in pretty much every facet and every area within our county and within our state, and it does need to be corrected and adjusted. And this is just 
the very first step that can be done to assist this. We're just asking that something that should not be in place is just simply taken away. You've heard plenty of people speak to give the reasons why, how it came about that didn't seem to be just. So all we're asking at this point is to take a stand, show the community exactly how you feel, either way you're going to. Even if you vote no, you're going to show exactly how you feel. So it's important to recognize what you're teaching our youth, what you're teaching the world, and where they're going to get their leadership from. Let these corporations, let our government agencies know that we support you bringing about equity. We support you bringing in other persons of color. We support you making your boards more diverse. We want to show you, we want to be the leader in this. I really appreciate your time uh, for allowing us to speak on this initiative. And I really hope, as uh, Mr. Willie Barney said as well, that you all do support and back this initiative. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Price. Anybody else? I'd like to speak, Gloria Osterberry, 5036 Pinckney Street, Omaha, Nebraska, and Omaha Together One Community. I am a white ally of all who have spoken in favor of repealing this uh, terrible amendment that uh, prevents affirmative action, which is so desperately needed in our region and nation. I, I simply support the efforts to indeed take this first step that's of such critical importance to us all. Thank you. Anybody else? Commissioner Burke. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And it, I debated on whether to um, say anything because I'm, I am not in support of this resolution. And I know I will be damned quite a bit for not supporting it, but I wanna explain why and you can take it for what it's worth. Um, I have never been a proponent of affirmative action policy I'm a minority in and of itself because I'm a woman. But I do not believe that that addresses the points that you all just said we need to address. This is not going to be a quick fix, a quick address to what the problem is. I think we need to look at when, what, where we are today, let's do an audit of county government. Let's look at how many minorities we've hired from 2008 until nine. I'm not saying it's done, we're good, we're there, but I think we've made progress. But I would prefer to have further discussion on other ways other than a policy that I don't think works. I think this policy is actually a divisive policy, not the end all be all answer to it. And I'm just trying to be brutally honest and understand. And if I don't understand something about this, then somebody explain it to me. Because, <laughs> friend of counsel's going, I will, I will. <laughs> I would love to sit down and have a conversation. Back before my friend Chris Rogers was on this board, Commissioner Kara Woods-Harris was on this board, and we had many conversations about this. And to me, it has nothing to do, and you again can take it as words, or you can take it as I'm trying to be brutally honest. It has nothing to do with the color of our skin. When you go to look at our policies of hiring, let's look at those. What's in there that is stopping the advancement or the hiring of African-American people, of minorities in general, not just African-Americans. Those are the things that I think we have to look at. If we know of people who are intentionally discriminating, as the one uh, young lady talked about that she used to work for, then they should be turned in. Yeah. But, but I do not believe that this policy will do what we want to do. And again, I'm just speaking from my heart and trying to understand. So Brenda, if you and I can have a conversation, I would love to because I do not understand how we all or you all are saying that this is gonna fix the problem. I think it will cause more divisiveness within our communities and within our hiring practice and our contracts than than helping it. 
if there's a new way of looking at things, which that's what I think we're trying to do is address things in a new way, then again, help me understand and help me bring something forward. But again, it's not that I don't support looking at county government in particular because we're here in county government and seeing where we do need more diversity, inclusion, and equity. I am all for that and I wanna be a part of it. I just don't believe in my heart that this policy is the right policy to address the issue that we're trying to tackle. And so again, um, for those who would still like to have um, some conversation about this with me, I welcome that. Um, I would prefer that rather than again just being damned because I don't support it but truly understand what I'm missing so I because I can't support it at this point thank, thank you thank you commissioner may Rose. I speak uh, you'll get an opportunity thank you uh, this is Mike Boyle let me be as brief as I can I there are opportunities. I really respect what uh, Commissioner Borgerson has said, <clears throat> and I, <clears throat> I, I don't agree with it, and I, but I do respect her opinion. Uh, w when I was in the mayor's office, uh, we had a, I inherited a uh, consent decree uh, with the Omaha Police Department because the uh, number of uh, uh, people with brown or black skin uh, was not, just didn't exist to any great degree. And um, I came back to the office one day and, and uh, the city attorney and a couple of other attorneys were in my office and they were jubilant because President Reagan had just announced that the consent decrees were uh, dissolved. They, they didn't exist anymore. And uh, so they, the attorneys were happy about it because it, I guess it saved them some work. I'm not really sure what. But um, my reaction to it was that uh, we need to keep it in place, which I did. I uh, just went ahead and put it, kept it in place because if we didn't, I told them we would be the same place we were 10 years ago with uh, inequities and lack of, uh, lack of uh, diversity. As a white person, I'm in no position to describe what a black or brown skinned person goes through. I simply don't understand it. I try, but I, I can't imagine uh, what happens. Um, I, I just really can't, I'm stunned by it. I've said many times here at this in this seat that, and I'm not talking about Mr. Borgerson or any other hey, people in this Ricky's instance. Ricky's going to be ready for Gavin at 11:30. Okay. Anyway, um, I believe firmly that uh, it really depends upon your your view toward this. It really depends upon how you were raised. You know that uh, if your family uh, accepts uh, people of all races and so forth, you will too. And hate begins at home. It really does. As words that are used, uh, I have a relative, uh, an in-law, uh, who was in a home that was uh, very, uh, very evil about talking about people using racial slurs, and he has finally come out of it. He and he doesn't accept it at all. But it, it is, it is taught. So that's one of the things we need to do is make sure that we we speak up and don't allow these things to happen. And per but I think. Um, we need uh, not to give preferential treatment, but we, we shouldn't discriminate against people and make sure that it's, our community is represented. So I am a strong supporter of this, have been really all my life. And um, so I, I really am a, a hope that this does pass and has Douglas County Board stand out as a, uh, a body that wants to be uh, known for fairness. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Boyle. Commissioner Kraft. I disagree with uh, Commissioner Borgeson, but um, I do think that, uh, by the way, there is a person who wants to speak by Zoom, and I just told him to speak up and identify themselves and ask to speak, okay? Um, in, in my opinion, those who vote against this are showing some of the systemic or hidden racism we have. And I don't mean this against Marianne. I don't think she's a racist at all. But this is not intended to end all, be all. And this is going to create conversation. It's going to create a lot of conversation. I think if there is a Nebraska Association of County Officials meeting, I would love to see the speakers who have spoken so far 
attend that meeting and do a presentation on this because they were eloquent, they were to the point, and by George, this is, this is, there's no reason we have this in our constitution. I want people to think back about how we discriminated against the Irish. No Irish need apply. The Oriental, the Jewish, and the Italian population. And I'm sure we're doing the same thing for many of the other ethnicities. Commissioner Rogers, thank you. And again, I say, this is something that does not belong in our constitution. Taking it out of the constitution is going to change anything, but it does not belong there. It does not belong there. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Kraft. Commissioner Morgan. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mary Ann, I share some of what you said, and uh, I like to be included. I tend to agree with you on this resolution, and I'd like to be included with you and Brenda when you have that talk and others, and I mean that sincerely. Um, back more than 20 years ago when Brenda ran for mayor, I was one of the first 10 or 12 she met with out on 87th and Cass, and I gave her a total commitment uh, of my support to be there for her in the 90s uh, because I thought she was the right person at the right time to do that job. And, uh, you know, I don't want anyone to take this wrong, but, uh, you know, I hope that Chris might consider laying it over a couple weeks so we could talk more about this. Uh, resolution and do some of those meetings that you're talking about because I don't see where this is going to be really helpful on that endeavor. Uh, so that's what I might suggest and uh, you know uh, I think about one special individual that I had in my life that when I was uh, lucky enough to be elected mayor I met a lot of people, and one of the people I met was Pip and Fox, all that worked down at the police station. And it took me about uh, 15 minutes to decide that Pip and Fox all should be the safety director, and he was with me the whole time that I was mayor, and was a great asset. He and I had many, many meetings, and he was right there in my office all the time. But uh, I want to do the right thing, and. So I uh, hope that you might consider that, Chris, and appreciate this bringing it up. So maybe you'd be included in that uh, meeting with Brenda and the four of us could meet to talk more about this. Thank you. I would like to kind of draw this to a close soon. Uh, we have a number of big items on our agenda that we need to Excuse get to. Me, I would like and to and we're going to run out of time soon. Having said that, any other comments? This is the opportunity. I am going to ask that you try to keep them kind of brief, please, because we are yes. going to run out of time soon. Good morning. Yes. Dominique Sierra, may I speak? The floor is yours, Dominique. Hi. So, uh, I live in 1506 South 118 Street, Omaha. I'm a Nebraska citizen. I have been here for the last 15 years. I came originally from Colombia and um, I practice human resources. This is at the core of the work that I do. And I can, for Marianne, um, I'm gonna give you two explanations why this is so important. First is bias and stereotypes. All us humans have bias and stereotypes. And that's the reason that we need to have guidelines and we need to help people accountable. The second thing is as a, as a city, as a state, we are never gonna be able to be com competitive with other parts of the country if we don't stop being the homogeneous group that we are right now. And the homogeneity, you can see it in the room where you are. 
So that's the reason why this is so important. And I know that because I practice HR. I, I know that because I hire people. I know that because I work with hiring managers who don't see the potential in anyone who doesn't look like them. So that is the reason that this type of thing is so important to put it back into the ballot and for people to really vote about it, knowing exactly the repercussion of what it is. I, I have a son and a, as, a, as a mother, I expect my son to be able to grow up in a community that is acceptable of all. And the way we are right now, it is not, and we can see it. What happened in the last month has shown us what Omaha is made of, and we need to live with what we are made of. And we need to get better and do better. So that, that is the reason. It is so important that you support this type of thing. Diversity, equity, and inclusion is important. It's important not only for me because I'm not Latina. It's important for you as well because I, we are living in the same community. I enrich this community. You enrich this community. And we, will, we should be able to have the same, the same advantages. On top of that, if we don't make businesses and our community accountable for change, that's never gonna happen. So that question of why is this so important is just as the basis of how racist as a community we are. Thank you, Ms. Sierra. Luis? I'm, I'm not hearing. 3306 Bird Street. There you go, thank you. Uh, Thank you for the opportunity to speak. This is um, a very important thing. I had no idea that in 2008 that a ban passed on affirmative action. A lot of things happened in 2008. I missed that. Uh, when I think about affirmative action, I think about uh, missed opportunities or denied opportunities, and that's what we're talking about, uh, opportunity to be employed. Uh, in the past, Hundreds of years, opportunity was lost through violence, through brutality, um, through uh, death. It is throughout this land, the, the side of the world, this continent, brutality was how, especially in the beginning, how Christians and Europeans established their administrations. And uh, the history that we know about is very small. Trust me, what is in the history books is just the tip of the iceberg, okay? Very ugly stuff. Today, we don't wanna lose opportunity for people based on, be, uh, solely on who they are because they wanna get um, a job. And, and so I don't, I don't understand how this is so divisive. Maybe the people who think that we don't have to correct the past, they need to understand uh, more of, of what actually transpired, um, especially to, to create political entities um, in this continent. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Borgeson. May hold. I speak, please? Yes, I, I, I would ask to keep it brief. Uh, we, we need to be moving on soon, but yes. Am I, can I speak? Yes, Linda. Uh, uh, oh, my, uh, I'm Linda Ryan, 11130 Jackson Street. And as a white woman from West Omaha, I absolutely support Chris Rogers' initiative. This does need to be taken out of the Constitution. And as for uh, Commissioners Borgeson and Morgan, you need to talk to Brenda Council. I hope she can make you see how you are still clinging to old white notions about affirmative action. I saw firsthand the, the good it did at a large corporation that I work for. Had it not been for that, it would still be run by all entirely white men. So please, uh, do support this resolution. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Anybody else wish to speak? I'm gonna give the last word 
to Commissioner Rogers. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Let me let me clear up just one thing. What we what I'm asking you to vote on on today is not policy. I'm asking for us to support the submission to us to be in support for the legislature to consider passing um, legislation to put this on the ballot this year. Not actually change the policy because the policy is federal law. The policy was reapproved in 1991 with tweaks. The policy has been reaffirmed by the Supreme Court, even though people are trying to change it, and they justify that there are tailored methods that need to happen. It's not going to happen overnight. And to uh, Brenda Council's example, to my very good friends and allies, Commissioner Borgs and Commissioner Morgan, it's not about the personal thing. I know what you would do personal. But the structural thing is something different. So I'm going to walk three examples and say that there's going to have to be some form of policy. It doesn't have to be this. You know, affirmative action goes all the way back to 40 acres and a mule. Affirmative action goes to the point of the Great Depression when laws were being written and certain policy elements were put into legislation to make sure that um, black agricultural workers that didn't do certain things didn't qualify for benefits. Affirmative action, and there's a whole book on it, when affirmative action was white. Affirmative action goes back to housing policy where it is proven and written here um, and noted in history that there's a box that existed, may still exist formerly from uh, Hamilton to Lothrop to 30th to 16th Street that a lot of people in this room grew up in. And their parents have lost generational wealth because they were not able to get out of that box and have homes. So what I'm saying is we can't get there without the policy. Everything that we've done juvenile justice wise, basically we're operating on federal law that says you can target disproportionate minority contact or racial and ethnic disparities. And when we talk about it, we talk about putting in intentional programming. That is some form of affirmative action. Now, I don't care what it's called, but the fact is, is that it's on the books. And for federal law and things that we have, you can exercise it. But it needs to be off the books so you can make something new and you can work at it. So even the example that we have now, I mean, for the recruiting that we do for corrections, we have an outreach program, but the outreach program can't target anything except more people in the same deal, which puts us back here. So I hear what Commissioner Morgan is saying is about holding it over. I don't want to hold it over. I didn't whip this vote. You know, my point is if you all want to sit down with Brenda, I want the vote to go. And then if you feel your change, Whatever your vote is, you can bring the motion back up. But today, it needs to move so the conversation can happen. Now, you know, I've said, and when we did the resolution one time before, I said that, you know, I, I didn't expect to be fighting this fight. I mean, I, I swear to God, I didn't expect to be fighting this fight, but I damn sure told myself that I wouldn't go shy away from it no more. And I didn't shy away from it before, but the world that we're in policy-wise, you go when the opportunity is there. And the opportunity is there now to go big and talk in certain languages. So like I said, we've been talking about structural inequalities. This is a piece of that. So, you know, my plea is, you know, pass it. If not, there'll be other shots. But the whole conversation over the last six weeks have been about bringing people along. It's going to feel uncomfortable. And there's going to be people that, that won't understand. We hear it here every week, people not understanding and getting it. So with that, I'd ask you for support. Uh, and um, if you don't feel it today and you want to bring it back up, you can have an opportunity to bring it back up. The main attempt was to put it in the ether for the legislature coming up next week. And so um, with that, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Rogers. I would now call for the vote.
motion passes four to two. Uh, Commissioners Boyle, Kavanaugh, Duda, and Rogers voting yes. Thank you. With that, I will move back to the beginning of the commissioners meeting uh, before we started rearranging everything. I uh, apologize to people I have kept waiting all morning. We, we've had a lot of important business to discuss, but we'll try to keep things moving along quickly here if we can. Item one, uh, approval of the minutes from last week uh, or two weeks ago, and item 1B, approval of claims for payments through July 21. What is the will of the board? Motion by Commissioner Boyle, second by Commissioner Rogers. Questions or comments? Could we please vote? You're abstaining? Yes. Commissioner Morgan is abstaining because there is a check written out to his company. Uh, Commissioners Rogers and Kavanaugh. Motion passes, five voting yes, one abstaining. Thank you. Next is the consent agenda where we find items A through K. Is there anything anybody would like pulled out for individual attention? We have a motion by Commissioner Borgeson, second by Commissioner Rogers to approve the consent agenda. If there are no questions or comments, could we please vote? Motion passes six to zero. Thank you. Under recognition, we have uh, following county employee retiring, Frank Edward Beals Jr. retiring from the Sheriff's Office after a mere 18 years of service. And good morning, Sheriff Dunning. Good morning, uh, Tim Dunning, Douglas County Sheriff. Uh, with me this morning, if I can get this uh, unhooked from my hearing aid. Bad enough to have hearing aids, but then you gotta do this uh, <laughs> Fumbling around. Jeez. Anyway, Frank, why don't you come up here with me? Um, Frank has been uh, an employee of Douglas County for just short of uh, 20 years. He's been a building security officer, uh, predominantly working the uh, evening shift. Uh, he's been a great employee. I've uh, had nothing but uh, Good comments uh, about Frank during the, the, whole, the whole time that he's uh, worked here. I can also say that in almost 20 years that he's been here, he's never had a complaint of, of any kind. Nice. Uh, I wish I could say the same for my whole uh, career. <laughs> uh, but he has, he's, he's been a great employee. And he's having a coffee here to, uh, shortly, but I won't be able to attend because of the uh, uh, CARES Act, uh, uh, conversation we'll mm -hmm. be having later on. So if you would uh, bear with me to uh, give him the coveted county clock. Great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Thank you for your service. And you for your service. <laughs> Thank you, Frank. It's been a pleasure to work in building security. And I know there's a lot of you at daytime don't see me, but uh, we take care of the building at night. And, uh, it's going to be a pleasure to be retired for good. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just gave the sheriff a little recognition. He told, he told me privately that he probably won't be attending any more county board meetings. <laughs> There's also a uh, <laughs> proclamation from the uh, county board uh, thanking you for your years of service. Very good. Thank, Thank you. you. Congratulations. Thank you. And Commissioner Borgeson wanted to say something. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And Frank, um, I just want to congratulate you on your retirement and uh, yes, go and <laughs> enjoy. But um, one of the things that I will miss about you is that I every single time I've seen you, you've had a smile on your face <laughs> and a warm welcome. And uh, I appreciate that and that'll be missed. So thank you very much for your service. But how do you, but how do you see his smile? It's behind a mask. <laughs> very good. Do we have a motion? Motion, motion and second by Commissioners Borgeson and Boyle. Could we please vote?
motion passes six to zero. Very good. Sure, Frank, thank you both. Wish you well. Citizen comments, would anybody like to address the county board on any issues that are not on the agenda? This is the opportunity to do so. Okay, seeing none. Um, we will move now to presentations, the CARES Act update, and I turn it over to Joe Lorenz. Yes, Commissioner uh, oh, you know. Joe Lorenz is gonna give the update on where we're at with the CARES Act, and then there will be some presentations from some departments on their uh, CARES Act proposed expenses, and then we'll go into the rental assistance update, and then Joe will also give a brief uh, update on utilities. Thank you. Okay, um, we've been continuing to spend the majority of our time in uh, corporate and in uh, county administration on uh, the CARES Act and rolling it out and uh, making sure things are being done in appropriately and in compliance. Um, what I'm ha having uh, Dan Esch hand out right now is uh, the latest compliance statements we that were issued from the federal government um, which it, it's been an interesting process as you, as you all remember a, a few months ago we, re, we received the 166 million from the federal government and it's almost on a every week or so now there's been further guidance uh, not all of which is straightforward some of which actually seems conflicting uh, and what we received in in the last uh, go round is um, it, this actually comes from the Inspector General and it lists reporting requirements and um, you know so I, I've uh, handed that out they want uh, a preliminary estimate of cert, of like five categories that have been spent or allocated out of CARES Act money that would be due this Friday so they actually gave people about two weeks notice to do this initial one and then there's a much more detailed compliance list that will have to be filled out on a quarterly basis and returned to the inspector general. And, um, you know, also the money first came out and it said it wasn't a grant, and, but now they've come back in and put all the grant compliance, uniform guidance, procurement, things like that to it. So it's just been a very interesting and an evolving process on this. And uh, it, it um, you know, there's a lot of work involved with it. So when you come in and we, we present to you, there's stuff going on behind the scenes on the compliance side that is very um, labor intensive and information intensive. So I just did want to sh alert you and share a little bit of that with everybody here to tell you what's what's really going on behind the scenes. And this is a is a moving target, and it's, and it's actually a very complex environment that we're dealing with. Uh, so I don't know if there's any questions on, on the compliance side. I'd be glad to take them. Um, yes, Commissioner Kavanaugh. Yeah, a couple, uh, Joe. And have, have we received this in the backup information? Or is this just? That's, that just came out Friday afternoon, okay. so it's just being handed out now. Um, if you could send it to us electronically. Sure. That would be great. Sure. Thanks. Um, so we've done some preliminary allocations of, of big chunks of money. I think there was $50 million put for administrative things. And there was 10 set aside for, I believe, like not-for-profit uh, designations. Yes. Um, and of that, um, the, the 10 million that we're talking about for not-for-profits, that's separate from what we've been talking about, for instance, in utilities and, uh, assistance, is gonna go through some not-for-profits in, in the administration of that. Yeah, that's, that's a separate that's my understanding, right? yes. This 10 million that we've talked about for not-for-profits has not been designated. No, it it's has not been, been allocated, you're correct, yes. Right. Right. The, um, the uh, Deloitte charges that we've talked about before, 
are they coming in on like a monthly basis or how are we getting the, the Deloitte? Uh, we have not received a bill yet. I would assume we'll, we'll, we'd be receiving their bills based on their work orders on, the, on when the work orders are complete because they're kind of billing us on an hourly basis through the work order. Right. So when the work order is complete, uh, then I would assume they'd bill us and then uh, we, that would be billed, you know, uh, paid for out of the money that's in the reserve of our CARES Act money. Right. So going forward, as we are billed by Deloitte, because that's going to be, as you indicate, kind of a running charge, could you make that part of your regular CARES presentation? Sure. I sure. know like that, I uh, yeah. other commissioners have, have inquired about this, and it's just... We haven't been billed yet, so that's why I haven't I, shown I you anything. I understand. Yeah. What I'm saying is, when we are and as we are going Absolutely. forward. Presumably they're not going to wait until the end right, of the right, right. Uh, yeah. year. Uh, just keep us appraised so yes. that we can do a kind of a running count of that. Um, and, you know, for instance, we're going to get to this in a little bit. They're serving an audit function for us. That's what we're talking about. The compliance here. part, yeah. Yeah. And they will be uh, referenced in the general assistance presentation this morning on rent assistance, okay? So their audit portion of that, compliance comp portion of that participation in that project, is that cost going to be designated to that project? Or Yes, be yes, because, well, certainly the part that we're talking about on rent assistance, about the call center and uh, all that, that's a sep every work order is listed separately and billed separately, and the rent, rent assistance um, capacity to uh, receive and process and forward um, request is a separate work order, and, when the, and that, so that will be a separate billing, yes. Okay. So, you know, to get kind of a sense of where that's going to come, I think we've allocated $10 million for rent assistance initially. There'll probably be more. Um, we need to know going forward what portion of that $10 million is going to Deloitte out of that pool of money, you know, so that we can calculate going forward what we are going to deliver to the actual rent assistance recipients because it will be $10 million minus whatever... Well, I think that that, that's up to the commissioners if we want to keep the billing separately and just say we're going to put the whole $10 million towards rent assistance, we could do that. I don't know how we going to rent assistance recipients if we didn't do that math, unless it's taken it's, out of, unless yes. it's not part of the $10 million. Separate. It's a separate. The, the money that we pay for services at Deloitte is separate and apart from the allocation for each of the rental assistance, utility assistance, nonprofits, right. or whatever. Yes. So. So it will not take away right. from the allocation. Very good. Yep. So we'll just get a running count. Yes. Going when, 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 we, when I receive it, I will definitely pass it on on a weekly basis. Great. And, you know, say we did this on a not-for-profit thing. I don't know what it would be designated for. But the same principle would apply. The, the, the yes. So it would be a different work order and a, and a different and a separate fee. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Joe, I, I'm uh, trying to figure out what, a, what, a, what is this anyway? I mean, it's got all zeros. Is this some kind of a form? It, it's a form that I have to fill out and submit by Friday, and it's zeros because I'm still waiting for all the data to come in. But okay, that's so just giving you guys a feeling of, you know, what, what we're being requested by. And like I say, this is kind of, they changed the rules on this. There wasn't supposed to be any interim reporting. And all of a sudden it came out and said it was due within two weeks. So Okay. All right, then um, I'd like to know what um, we're talking about Deloitte as more like a, uh, it seems to me like we're having them do more than just uh, audit spending. I mean, they're involved in a call center and some other things. Doesn't that make them a provider? They have to audit themselves or what's the deal? Are they, are they doing work beyond auditing us? They, and uh, Patrick can address this, you know, there's- uh, I'm Just a yes or no, are they doing that? They're doing the call center, yes. Well, why? I mean, isn't this a half a million dollar deal? I know. It's not, I know, we never, you know, like I said, who made that decision? Was it you that? It was, was not it, me, no. Okay, then was it you, Patrick? It was a recommendation to the board. And the, From whom? To retain Deloitte? Right. To use Deloitte 
And as I stated at no, the no, last... wait a minute, Patrick. You're saying that the board actually voted to say we want Deloitte to do operate a call center for uh, rent assistance and other things? Did, did, is that the answer, yes or no? Did we do that? If we didn't, well, then we can't, we can't do this. Well, 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 Commissioner, if I can respond to that, I, so... It better be clear, though. No double talk, I know, okay? Well, I, if, it's, it's going to be a matter of whether you think it's double talk, I, I can't say. But um, we met, Who, uh, myself you? and Melissa Seawick and Joe and Deloitte, and we talked about the best and most efficient way to do this, and we talked about how if we had for use nonprofits, we would have to go through an application process where, because we couldn't just select what nonprofits we wanted to use. No, you certainly federal, could. You, you, we certainly not, could. No, it's well, a federal regulation so that we can't just. Okay, now I don't that. mean to drag this up, but we just bought thirty thousand dollars worth of masks, and we didn't go out to bid on that. So I'm, I don't mean to bring that up, but there's been some selective purchasing. So, I, I, it's not your job to make those decisions, Patrick. You should have brought that to the board, and if you're we saying did. you didn't, we did. Okay, now, and t that's what I'm asking you. Did the board say yes or no to what you're? The board said yes. Okay, and what? And how so? I don't remember that at all. It must have been an awfully fast deal. Does anybody else remember that? That I we heard. hired Deloitte to make to operate a phone center. I mean, we did hire them to audit the spending. This puts them in the, in the position of auditing themselves. That's pretty bizarre. I, I want to see the document, before we go much further, I want to see the document and the votes that were cast to have Deloitte be the call center. We did not vote on Deloitte being the call center. Well, then we, what in the hell are we doing having them be the call center? You have to vote on these things because we, it's a $500,000 expenditure. We voted on Deloitte to be our auditor and right. to help guide us through the process. Right. When we allocated money for rent assistance, our directions were very clear to our staff that uh, we, we wanted people to have checks by July 1, as I, I recall. Can't, clear, I, I mean, can't that was the, the imperative. Hear. We wanted to get the checks out as quickly as possible. Sure. Staff came back to us and said, here is the quickest way to get the money out. How did they know that? They didn't talk to any nonprofits. Did you even talk to the nonprofits about this? You just assumed it. We had one of the nonprofits come down at the last meeting and state that she believed that what we were doing was the best and avenue. Who, and who was that? That was, the, I believe it was the lady from Together One. From whom? From Together One. Well, she I never believe. said that. Erin? Yeah, she came down to the podium and talked and said that she was happy and pleased with the way things were going and, and how we were planning on doing it. So um, I, she, we well, came down. Yes, she did. I mean, I, Okay, the so other commissioners can can support no, me on that. That's Patrick, what happened. Patrick, so in other words, you just want, if, if that even happened, I doubt it, because I know Erin and I've talked to her, and she that is not what she meant to say if that's what you think she said. Because the deal is that now you're, now you're saying you didn't want to go to all these nonprofits and have to do this, but you relied on one person you think who said, yeah, it's the best deal to pay Deloitte half a million dollars to do this instead of a nonprofit. I did not say that. Well, I, did not, I did not say I relied on that. Well, you must have. No, you relied no. on her, Erin. No. She came down after we made the recommendation. She's I'm just saying that she came down and made that statement. So Patrick, we, you're, we, you're, I stood, you're relying on what she said, but go ahead. I stood at that podium at the last meeting and explained to the board what we were going to do. And I did not, the only negative feedback I received was from one commissioner. So mm -hmm. I went with what the consensus of the board was, and Patrick, and that's that, what we're that doing. That is not how this is if, to operate. Well, you, if you the board just, doesn't agree with that, then the board can make Patrick, a different decision. You are not to make the decision. You are to bring the options to this board and lay them out, and then we will make the choice. And we didn't do that. Somewhere along the line, you guys got off the rails and decided it'd be nice and comfortable to just have Deloitte do it for us. We, well, you know, we've, been, just, we've been sharing lots of emails for a long time. As well, I, I understand it, to have Deloitte do this work, they can hit the ground running. It's going to cost about 4% for an administrative fee to have them do it. If we do it in-house, it slows the process up greatly. What's in-house? What's that If mean? we don't have Deloitte do it, if we go out and hire people ourselves to do it, if we go through the local nonprofits, this was the quickest way, and, and, there's, and there is about a 1% difference in administrative fees. 
going this way, having Deloitte do the work for us, there's going to be about a 4% sure. okay. uh, okay. administrative I, I, fee. I'll if we do it in-house, it's going to be a 3% administrative fee. Show me that. I never saw that figure. I Who's saw it in my email to you. Show me. It, uh, who, who did that? Who prepared that? I, the, the sentiment of the board is we want to well, get these checks out quickly. Those were the directions we gave to staff. And for one commissioner to now tell staff they've done it wrong because they made decisions and they followed the will of the board, we're never going to get anything done. Well, Claire, it's your fault. I'll be honest. Okay, I've been, okay, Claire, be quiet fault. just for a minute, just a second here. Of course. I've been quiet when you were. I pleaded with you to do two uh -huh. things. Who can apply for funds? I asked you that repeatedly. I, then I said, the second question is, you know, uh, how, how, what about a form? How do they apply? How do you apply? I asked those two things and you have never responded. I even sent out a, fa a form for you to go by and no one on this board responded to it. So, but I, I don't, I did not participate and you cannot pass those things over the internet. Uh, it is illegal to poll the, the board. You do, don't laugh if you want, but it's he, illegal to poll the board. Instructions. I didn't give that instruction. You're the only one who doesn't want Deloitte to do this. The because rest of the board is comfortable with it and has asked staff to move forward to get the checks out as quickly well, as possible. You have and not, you're slowing the process up. No, I have been trying to get the checks out quickly, as Mr. Cavanaugh has as well, and you have not responded. I don't, to, have, to hire this company to, because they did hurricanes in the past, so that when someone from Omaha calls for rental assistance and somebody in Cincinnati answers the phone and the woman says, and I need food, what does she say? What does she say? She's gonna say, well, call, uh, call some other number. So now they're getting jacked around, the taxpayer, the person who needs help. That's, if you if you have local nonprofits doing this, this is what they do in their sleep. They do this all the time. They refer people for food and help. They know the people. I mean, it's such an advantage to have it done, as you say, in-house. I'm not doing it in-house. I'm saying use the people in Omaha who are familiar with what, what can be done, where to go to get food, what the latest thing is on how you help people. Someone in, in, in Cleveland or wherever, uh, Baton Rouge, is not going to have that information. So I think it's just a big mistake. And also, I do not approve. If we ever made a vote on it, I want to see the proof and I want to see who said what and who seconded it and everything else. I don't think it exists. I don't think this the thing that we're doing, the board actually totally, completely, and legally approved. Please show me the documents. We didn't vote on it. There's well, if no we didn't vote on it. If we didn't vote on it, then it's not legal. It's not legal for staff to do anything without us voting first? No, it isn't. Okay. We, we have to have okay. a vote of this board to spend that kind of money. To do anything. They can't do anything without our blessings first. Well, they can do anything. Oh, present us with options, and then we choose, and then we'll decide what we're, what we're going to pay them. We're, they'll tell us what it costs, and we can't spend $500,000 without a vote of this board, if that's what you're telling me. We did vote on that. Well, you just said we didn't. Would somebody help me? We're just wasting an entire morning for so many important people. We've got Dr. Poor sitting here. You, and, I asked you, and I asked you to bring her up earlier, didn't I? I asked you, please get Dr. Poor up here earlier, and you didn't. I didn't know what item she was here well, for. Who I have many requests to go early. Well, you, you shook your head yes, and you didn't do it. You should respect her time and bring her up. I okay, asked so you to do that. So let's get right into the, the naked truth here. This, we did not vote on this resolution, and I, I call this out as a complete lack of uh, leadership and also a lack of following the law. Can anyone produce a document that says so-and-so uh, made the motion, so-and-so seconded, and the vote was whatever? I just want to see that. Who, who's got that, Mr. Esch? Do you, do you have that kind of document? Well, I'm looking, Dan Esch, County okay. Clerk. I mean, I can look to see okay. what, when that Deloitte item contract came up, I can certainly see how there, so, commissioners, there, there will be work orders every time there's a task order. Their county board will approve those. And so when it comes time for them to, right now they have, I think it's $308,000. When we reach that cap, we'll come back and there'll be a task order and the county board will approve it. So, you know, I have, I, I, all I can say to you, Commissioner, is that, you know, the county attorney has been involved with every step of the way. And I presented everything to the county board. If the county attorney wants to say that what we've done is not appropriate and we have to come back with 
a resolution for the county board to vote on using Deloitte or even do it today, um, well, we can't, that's fine. We, we can't do it today. It's not on the agenda. Well, there could be a, an emergency could be uh, well, declared. We, we're not doing that for sure. Well, I don't think we should. We, we, for some reason, we went off the rails on this whole thing. We absolutely went off the rails. We have Bargeson, not approved. Commissioner Bargeson, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just, we, here's how on June or July 23rd, uh, no, it's not July 23rd, June 23rd, <laughs> we passed the resolution putting, putting forth $10 million for rental assistance. During that discussion and during that, um, before the vote, it was uh, told to staff to hurry it up and get the process in place so that we can get the money out to the folks who are needing it for rental assistance. The next week, they brought the process back, Patrick presented it, and the board gave the consensus to move forward because it was the fastest and most efficient way to do what we were trying to do, and that was to get the folks to apply and get the money to the landlords to pay their rent. Thank you, Commissioner Borgerton. Well, Commissioner Kavanaugh is waiting for the floor as well. Commissioner Kavanaugh. So, uh, you know, what I wanted to make clear with Joe was by knowing that Deloitte's bills are coming in, we can pass on these things. Uh, Commissioner Boyle is exactly right. There was no vote on this. And if it went through the, the cracks, well, so be it. Going forward, we need to have pre-approval of the Deloitte bills so that we know what we're being charged for. We'll, we'll have some more discussion on this under another category, but I don't think that this board has delegated to the staff unfettered payment of $166 million to Deloitte or anybody else. And I don't think we legally can over a certain amount do those things. When we had the discussion of the contract, I, I, I keep coming back to this, we passed on a $5 million contract and everybody was saying, no, 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 it's only a $300,000 contract. Well, now we're seeing, well, maybe that's the 300,000 under the contract, but this is not under the contract because this is not audit stuff. This is, you know, phone bank stuff or something else. I wanna know what we're paying Deloitte in Toto out of this 166 million. And the simple way to do this is just bring it to us we can vote it up or down, but you know we're supposed to be responsible to the public for spending this money. Not Patrick, not Joe, with all due respect, they're not elected by anybody to do anything. We are. And so all I'm saying is it would be a simple thing if every week during our CARES update that our finance director or administrative officer, somebody brought to us, here's the bill from Deloitte for this and this and this, voted up or down. That's just responsible doing business. Rather than we're gonna have these ongoing discussions because Commissioner Boyle's right. We can't just rubber stamp these things in a phone call or an email that some of us may or may not even have been party to. This is official public business and it needs to be done in the open, in public, after discussion and, and, and consideration. And so I, I just think that's good business. And, and Joe has agreed to bring us the Deloitte bills as they come in. I don't know why we can't then vote on them as they go. Like any other expense to the CARES project, we should be careful in our expenditures of this money. Otherwise, things are going to go wrong. Things will go wrong if we don't watch out for this money. Trust me. So. I, I, I don't know if that's you know, gonna be a problem going forward. Joe seems to indicate that we could easily do that. I'm sure that Patrick and the administration would love to do the, the thing that the board wants them to do. And so the easiest way to do that is, let's vote as a board on spending this money when we spend it. Thank Claire. you. I, I'm not real comfortable once we vote to approve an expenditure and whoever we approve, in this case, we did vote to hire Deloitte, and then when they do the work, now we'll decide whether or not we're gonna pay you for it. I'm not, I'm not real comfortable with that 
uh, approach. Commissioner Boyle. Claire, could I interrupt for one second? Front work. That's okay. the difficulty. We hired them to audit spending. We did not okay. hire them to do make phone calls. We did not hire them for that. And when Cotton. Commissioner Borgeson talked about the June 23rd $10 million rental thing, if that was the correct date, I don't know if that's the correct date or not, but there, this, is the, this is the next meeting after that. We haven't had any meetings between then, between then, and so whatever somebody told staff, you said the staff was told to do this. Who told them, you know? And uh, it, it's just, I, I think you think things happened and maybe you usurped the authority of the board or something and took it upon yourself, but I was not involved in it. I don't think the board itself was. There are no documents that support what you're trying to do. This is, I, I, and first of all, uh, I, I think that we need to have a clear picture of what the nonprofits would charge us, what they would do if they have people, and we haven't done that. I, yesterday, I, I was on an OTOC call, and I tried to get some other commissioners on, and uh, no, no one got on with me. And so uh, I was always careful because of the open meetings law, I could only ask two or three, and no one got on. So I was there by myself, and they asked questions about what's going on, and I am in no position to answer because I, you know, if, if somebody said tell the staff to do this, I wasn't one who did. But the point is two things. We don't know what the nonprofits would cost. We don't know for sure, and someone, you know, because uh, Patrick apparently heard Aaron say that it's the best deal. Uh, I don't know what that what that amounts to, but I think we need to really ask the nonprofits groups uh, what they could do and what it would cost, and compare that with uh, what Deloitte's doing because Deloitte is doing more than we asked them to do. So your request then is we put everything, just put the brakes on, and come back and do this research and come back and at a later date to decide how we're going to distribute the funds. Mr. Duda, I've been pleading with you to uh, who, who gets, who qualifies for the funds and how do you apply? I've been doing that for, for I know, but now months. we're pushing it back It's more. because it's screwed up. Could I have a point of personal privilege here? Does our Zoom prior, they just had a technical Yes, um, we're trying to fix right now the computer locked up, but we're trying to get it back on, so. Is it coming back on? We're trying. We're done? We're trying, We're trying to get it back on. I, I'm sorry, I'm difficulty hearing what she's saying, Claire. Sorry. We're getting there. Okay, thank you. So I, what I'm trying to say, Mr. Chair, is that uh, we, we can get that information very quickly. I, I, I am not, I'm, a commissioner shouldn't be responsible for going out and getting that, that information. Our staff should have done that, but they didn't. For some reason they were hell-bent on hiring Deloitte. Uh, and I can understand why, because that would be the simple way for them to do it. But I, I think what, we can do what you are asking then is that we do that this afternoon. The staff finds out from nonprofits what what their cost is, what they would do to make these calls, their estimated value, and then we'll and vote on it in two weeks. We get, then we can have a special meeting. Uh, what is today? Anyway, Tuesday we could have a special meeting on Friday and award all these contracts. That's what I'm saying, because it was not done properly. If that we, we cannot approve this. We don't. We set the calendar at the beginning of the year. I'm sorry we didn't meet on the 4th of July. That was determined at the beginning of the year. That was last week, I think, whatever. Well, anyway, I don't know what to say about this, and I hate to be the... I, I don't either. I the hate board, to, well, uh, Here's what I... The board what I, here's what did I give about. staff direction. They followed our direction. You didn't like it, and now you want them to start over again. The board did... I don't know who, what board you're at talking about. At the board meeting, when we approved this, this we made it No, we clear. did not. We did not. You didn't say you wanted people to have checks by July 1? You don't remember saying that? Oh, Claire, that? you're putting words yeah. in his mouth. You do remember saying that. We could that. certainly have done this in less than four months. Okay, so now now we're moving too slow again. Claire, please, all, we're, all I'm trying to do is do it legally. And I want to know what the local nonprofits can do because they know the people will be a heck of a lot better, I believe. That's my opinion. I could be wrong, but we don't have the information. And so all we have is Deloitte that comes in and is, says we do hurricanes so we can do this. I, I, I don't buy that. It's very expensive and we don't have, I want to compare the cost. So what I'll do right now, I want to ask our staff, I guess if you can direct the staff, I will too. Patrick, I want you to contact uh, all the nonprofits that uh, you have a list of, all of them. Contact them all, ask them what they would charge for uh, a certain volume. They'll know what the volume is, for what they would charge us and uh, when they could have it done. That's what I'm ordering you to do, okay? And then you come back to the board, and then we'll see if it's a doable deal. If it isn't, 
then we're, we're, we're going to do Deloitte. It's as simple as that. We, but you never made the comparison. So that's what I'm asking, and we'll have a special meeting on Friday. We, this could take you know, no, no time at all. If we have the data, if it comes out as a, a bummer, then we do Deloitte. And if it's not a bummer, we do them. Commissioner Borgeson. When Patrick brought the recommendation to the board on the process through the PowerPoint, and we all have a copy of that PowerPoint, it was stated that he had had conversations with Deloitte about the various ways to do this. If we do it through nonprofits, their process would be that they each nonprofit would have to be vetted and an application process would have to happen. We kept saying, or Patrick kept saying, because we kept saying, that we wanted this done as quick as possible. So they came back with a recommendation um, upon which Commissioner Boyle, you said you wanted people from here, from our community hired, and Deloitte said they would be able to accommodate that in a very quick turnaround. And again, Patrick brought that to the board and the board you know, was okay with it. And we were moving forward, so um, we thought. Um, so again, we, we have had the money for four months. We voted on July, June 23rd to approve rental assistance. The next week on June 30th, we approved utilities along with the presentation that was given by Patrick on the process of how we were going to implement rental assistance. And as far as I knew, we were moving forward with that because of the consensus of the board agreeing that that was the fastest and most efficient way to move. That's my recollection. Mind you. And so I'm fine, I guess I should say, I'm fine with our process continuing on um, so that we can again hurry up from the June 23rd vote to approve the $10 million rental assistance to get that out to get these rents paid so the eviction processes are halted or don't go into um, effect. Commissioner Boyle. I appreciate the summary, but uh, you sort of you got to the end there and you said we were okay with it. Now that's, that's not the legal way. If you're okay with it, uh, that is not a formal action. And that's what was missing. And also this series of things, I mean, I have been pushing, and don't blame me for us being in this situation, I have been pushing to get this, who can apply, and how do you, you know, what's the application form? It should be really straightforward. And we haven't been able to do that. We should have had money in the hands on July 1st, and we don't. So, well, not to the extent that we should have. And the whole point is we never voted. Produce the document that says we should hire Deloitte. And I don't know who, you know, the. When, when Patrick comes back and had conversations with people, that's not a vote, and we didn't have the vote. I hate to point this out, but it's not legal, and I, I feel like there's this railroad thing that Deloitte's there, so let's use them. I, I don't like it, and all I'm asking is, and if you won't do it, I will take it upon myself to contact all the nonprofits today and tomorrow and find out what they will charge to run an operation like that. We have some of them in the audience. Maybe they can prove me wrong, which I'm sure some people would like, is there someone in the, who represents a nonprofit who does that takes these kind of phone calls from people looking for help? Please step forward. Would you mind and, and, and sure. tell us, uh, you know, give your name and the organization and all that? Sure, uh, Mindy Pace. Can you take your mask down oh, and yes. speak into the microphone? Yeah, uh, Mindy Paces. I work for Heartland. Can somebody Day. turn her mic on? Is that better? No. Is this one on? Yeah, I guess so. Okay. Um, Mindy Paces, I'm the Vice President of Housing and Financial Stability with Heartland Family Service. You know, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Can anybody hear her? Yes. Okay, I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry, what are we doing? Heartland Family, Family Service. Service. Right. Okay. Do, you, do, you, do you get phone calls from people asking for help? Yes, we have a homeless prevention program that we've operated um, for many years. We've been doing housing and homeless assistance 
since 1999. So if someone calls and asks you for food or ask you for something else, I mean, what do they usually ask you for? I know I've heard of Heartland Family Services, and you, uh, what do you do? Who, what kind of service do you provide? Yeah, so we, um, we've been in the community for many years. Um, we have a variety of services that we offer, ranging from counseling and prevention services, housing, financial stability, and community well-being programs. So, um, you know, when somebody calls us, we um, are able to, if they're calling for rent and utility assistance, we connect them appropriately and provide services to assist them through their housing crisis. Um, if they're needing other assistance, such as food or other needs, um, you know, our agency has created a network of um, partners in the community that um, we work very efficiently with. So if there's something that, you know, we're not able to provide, then we partner with other agencies to do that work as well. How do you partner with them? Do you tell the person to call them or do you get, the, how does that work? Do they get referred and have to make their own call? No, so we um, are a part of the metro area continuum of care for the homeless and they've created, um, there's a lot of, as a, larger, as a larger system of providers, they have a coordinated entry system that, um, you know, providers come together and there's a central place for people who are seeking assistance. So. Um, if you come to Heartland um, and we can't help you, there's other agencies that can help and it's a coordinated effort. What about, do you have regular customers? Mm -hmm. Okay, and I guess, I'll, is, is there some value in, in knowing who you're talking to and what their past history is with you? Yeah, I, I mean, I would say definitely as it pertains to this conversation, the concern um, for having an outside entity um, manage a call center is that, um, that people, when they're calling us, they're not calling us just for rent and utility assistance. There's a variety of other needs. There's a lot of trauma that's come with this pandemic and, and people need other services. And so, um, you know, while I support um, general assistance and the work that they're doing, and certainly if they're able to provide that service, that's wonderful. Um, but I would say that our, um, my, uh, I, I believe that it should be done locally and that there should be um, connections in the community connecting people to those um, resources that are needed now more than any other time before. And how old is your agency? Um, we, a long time, over 100 years. Oh, okay. Well, I thank you for stepping up, and I know I think I see Aaron here. You're the one who got, would you step up? Would you tell us what, thank you very much. You're welcome. And I, I do want to get your phone number before you leave and your name, okay? Hello. Good morning. Erin Feichtinger, 812 South 24th Street, representing Together Omaha. I had community outreach and advocacy. I want to clarify my statements from last week. Um, Put the microphone right in front of your face. Oh. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, can you hear me now? Yep. So last week, my uh, I did express support for the program. My uh, support was around the eligibility requirements. Um, and uh, the amount of people that we would be reaching. I do not feel that it was our role last week as an organization to comment on the legality or um, ethics of hiring or involving Deloitte. Um, now that we've gone down this road and uh, we had the Health and Human Services Committee on Thursday where the process was described in more detail, I do want to say that uh, we are concerned about the fact that it'll take two weeks to turn around an application based on what was said in the Health and Human Services Committee. And I would concur with my colleague from Heartland. Um, you know, we, we are well versed in doing this. Uh, you know, we deal with funds from all sorts of various governmental agencies all the time. And we have about a three day turnaround um, from the time someone calls us and needs help uh, to getting them the help that they need. Um, Commissioner Boyle, you asked how much it would cost us to do this. I said I would do some digging for you um, to hire, let's say, one staff member at Together, and uh, it would cost us about $50,000 um, because we believe in paying a living wage and also providing them benefits. It would also take us some time to train them to do this work uh, and to make sure that we're in compliance. So um, I don't know what the solution is. I agree with Commissioner Kavanaugh that we've been down, we've been dealing with this for several months, and so. Our community, the nonprofit community, is a bit in a bind here of saying that we needed this money to go out yesterday. We needed to help people yesterday. And also understanding that there is a process that needs to be done here. Um, so hopefully that's helpful. And thanks for your time. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Aaron.
Commissioner Campbell. There have been a series of committee hearings on this under the County Board's Health and Human Services Committee going back to May. Regarding this specific question, it was a question of how can we most quickly get money to people who need rent assistance? And after a series of these hearings, and I don't know if you were able to be there, where we had discussions from all of these not-for-profits, from general assistance, from our own staff, we determined based on the advice of staff that the quickest way to get money to people for rent assistance after four months of it sitting in our bank account was to utilize this model. General assistance worked with Deloitte to put it before us, I believe, last Thursday and has a, a PowerPoint presentation for us here in our uh, materials today. And it's just predicated on the fact that this is the quickest way, if you're interested in getting people money as fast as you can, that in all of our staff's opinion, we pay them for their opinion, to do that. And that's where I'm going with this. I want to get people money. We've had these discussions. You know, you're talking about go and talk to all these not-for-profits. They were at all these hearings. Aaron has been at every hearing that there has been on this, and we've had a full and fair discussion of what's the quickest way to do this. And so if we want to proceed with getting people rent assistance in this month, and I'm not satisfied that that's even you know, satisfactory, but it's as quick as we can do it now, then we need to proceed. Going forward, we need to have all the bills come before us every week and we vote on it. That's what I was talking to Joe about. Bring those bills to us and we'll see how they go. But I'm not interested in going back to square one after having all these hearings on this specific point and then getting the advice that we got and then proceeding with general assistance and they're gonna present to us here in a little bit about the quickest way now going forward, the amount that, the reason I was asking about the administrative fees that Deloitte will charge for doing this isn't gonna come out of the 10 million. That's what I was talking to Joe about. That's gonna be a separate administrative cost. So I'm interested in getting people rent assistance as soon as possible. If we can do that doing this, and they're not going to be taken out of the 10 million, and we're going to be asking for more than 10 million going forward for administration, it's not perfect. It's not the best of all worlds. Perfect would have been we were doing this in May when we started these hearings. Now, this is as good as we can get, and let's get the money to the people going back three months before they're four months in arrears, and now that the eviction courts are open up, that they're defending their right to stay in their apartments. I, I, I agree with you, Commissioner Boyle. This is not the best way to do this. This thing has not been well supervised, well planned out. Too much of it has happened behind closed doors. But this particular portion, this was done in public hearings going back to May, and we have had these every other week. We'll have another one probably next week. And this is as good as it could get. We need to do exactly what you're saying on the money going forward. And Deloitte hasn't submitted any invoices, so we haven't paid them anything. And vote on it going forward. Because this is not part of that contract that I voted against that you guys all supported. This is a separate deal. So they're going to need our authorization for this money week by week by week. And I think that's the best way to go today, if we want to get people rent assistance in July. Thank you. Commissioner Boyle. plan is, are you saying use uh, general assistance and uh, it's uh, Deloitte that oversees it? Is that what use you're saying? Use this, yes. The, the process that was the result of multiple committee okay. hearings and board discussion, use that because it's not perfect, but it's ready to go. And okay, get well, listen. people rent assistance this month. Okay, I'll tell you what, I, I'm willing to, uh, if we will vote on uh, naming Deloitte as the agency, if that's what you're talking about. I'm not, still not real clear, but I know that uh, we have, uh, you know, Melissa would be the person who would be running this. That's fine with me. I just want to keep it, if it can be local. And if it does involve Deloitte, so be it. I'll, I'll yield on that. But I want us to vote on it. 
I want us to have a clear vote that we're selecting Deloitte to do this. So that's what I'm asking. If you want to declare, somebody said declare an emergency, fine. But let's do get it done. I think this is, uh, uh, you know, this is like making sausage in public. It's really tough. It doesn't look good. Okay. So is there, you know, is there, I'll make a motion that I guess, uh, I'm not really sure what it, what it should be, but we got to get this done and over with. And I'm even yielding to me, my own position on the nonprofits doing it. I think they should, but. Well, maybe Mike, when Melissa presents her thing, okay. that we do okay, it Okay, let's do that then. I'll, all right, thank you. Thank you. Joe, do you want to continue? Have you okay. said more than enough? All right, I'll finish up real quick. And I know uh, Patrick and Melissa will come up with the uh, rent update. So the only other part I wanted to talk about is rent assistance is like one module that we're working on and we'll, you'll get an update of that and we're talking about that too and closely associated with that is utility assistance. But the other uh, module that we're working in place and working uh, both in conjunction with the state of Nebraska and Deloitte on is the uh, expenses of local government. Expenses of local government besides our own. So I can tell you that expenses have been, uh, we have preliminaries, uh, submittals from the city of Valley, the city of Bennington, uh, Mecca, and uh, the city of Ralston. And what we're gonna do is we're very close to having uh, the, uh, uh, a portal set up uh, that will be very similar to what the, the system that the state of Nebraska is using and we will take their submitted uh, expenses and we'll vet them and for compliance with the CARES Act. And uh, so that, that process will, uh, is underway and we should be able to start bringing those through by the end of the week. So uh, I, I just wanted to tell you that, you know, we've been spending a lot of time here on, on rent assistance, but we've also been working on local government, both internal and external. And I think in uh, two weeks when we meet again, we're gonna have like the, what I call the uh, associated units of uh, local government uh, come in and talk about their CARES Act expenses. And that would be the building commission, dot com, the election commissioner. Uh, we've been working with all of them. They've all incurred expenses driven by the pandemic. And so we're gonna bring those forward at the, at the next meeting. So that's kind of my update excluding rent and utility assistance, and I'd be glad to take any questions on that. Thank you, Joe. Yes. Thank you, Joe. A and today we're having internal units come from uh, the sheriff, the, uh, the health center, and corrections. Commissioner Cavanaugh. I, I thought that there was something from uh, collection of the arts and entertainment groups in Omaha as well, is that part of this? Yeah, we have not gotten to that yet. We're right now, we're, they're not considered local government, so I, I think the arts and entertainment groups are considered more in the nonprofit area, and, and you know, there's different definitions of so nonprofits. Nonprofit will be at a different date than next week? Yes. Okay, do we yeah. know when? Um, I would assume that as soon as we can get uh, rent assistance up and going, we can uh, co start concentrating on nonprofit. That's next on our list. Okay, thank you. Commissioners, I, I guess I would ask that we move the agenda on a little bit and do rental assistance first because it's 1230 almost. We have to leave we, the chambers at 130. We, do, we lose the chamber in an hour, but we've had right. the sheriff and the okay. administration from our health center. We've had Dr. Torr sitting here for three and a half yeah. hours. The only now. reason I ask, Commissioner, I completely understand and agree with you. The only reason I ask is because we are going to recommend that the county board make some changes today to that rental assistance program to increase the amount of money that we put into the pot to increase the amount of allocation to um, each of the renters in the amount of time. Um, to waive some of the other requirements we had initially recommended. So I just want to make sure that we have time for those actions right. to be taken And I want to today. make sure we get all the public hearings that are advertised. Understood. So uh, I, we need to kind of move quickly here in this last hour. So I'm done, who do you want next? Uh, well, the Health Center is first on, on the list. <laughs> <laughs> and Aaron points to Dee Dee. <laughs> 
good morning or good afternoon. afternoon. <laughs> um, let's see, we moved some stuff. Here we go. All right. Uh, Okay, I'm going to start off. I'm just going to give you a quick overview of the distributions we've received and some of the acceptable uses. Um, I will say that this is kind of a shift. In the past, you guys have been talking about the 166 million that you had received, that the county had received. These are actually the $1.2 million that the health center received directly. Um, they were for healthcare providers. We received those in three different um, distributions. Two of those were the 510,000 out of the general distributions from HHS, and then we got an additional 690,000 specifically for skilled nursing facility providers. So that is our total of 1.2. Um, they are basically, the use is the same. It is to prevent, prepare for, and respond to coronavirus. And the one change is if we so choose, it can be used to cover a revenue loss or it can be used again to cover expenses. Sorry, I forgot to change that the first time. Um, major categories of spend um, over all of the 1.2 million that we are um, sh gonna give you some detail for is screening both for our visitors and residents. That's approximately $38,000. Infection control, to contain and decrease the spread between our departments and units, that's 875,000, and technology, both for employees and for our residents. It will be about 305,000. So in the slides that are coming up, Aaron's gonna go through each of those areas and give you a little bit more detail. Okay, good afternoon. Um, many of these are easy to come up with as they are not really a, <clears throat> a wish list item, but a needs list. Um, we talked with our staff uh, following state guidelines and CDC guidelines. Uh, we continue to have to screen all visitors um, and staff that come in to our in facility. So we invested already, this has already been an expenditure that we have done, in a thermal scan thermometer as people come in through the front doors. We have been doing uh, oral temperature taking since mid-March. Um, this has increased kind of staff satisfaction as they come to work out every day. We just have a thermoscan scan and we record their temperatures. So that is something that will be ongoing probably until many months into the future. Um, also, we're investing in a visitor and badge monitoring system. Uh, part of the CMS phasing guidelines is that eventually when we can have visitors back in the facilities, they'll have only be by appointment only. So we will have that in place. We've also, um, talking with staff, many of the neighborhoods would share equipment and so we figured out that we needed to invest in additional equipment that could be segregated by the different units at the facility so that's part of the screening the second part is infection control and so we've already invested negative air uh, machines we already had five there's actually five units with those installed on right now and those were installed in late March and early April by public properties, and I think that did make a difference in our containment in the facility. So we will continue to let those run and scrub the air in the facility until we get some of the new air handlers and stuff in place. Um, the other thing that we've been looking at in many long-term care uh, jails, hospitals have used is a UVC disinfectant lamp or robot. Um, we found some issues as we had to terminally clean some of the rooms. People have their entire house in an eight by 10 area, and it was very difficult to actually terminally clean. So this UVC robot will actually act as a germicidal and kill the COVID virus. So we look at investing in either two to three of those. Um, we did change our chemical disinfectant to oxyside. And so as a consultant, they have a monthly review of our infection control processes which will be advantageous for the state when they come in to do our audits. So that will be a monthly, a consulting for $12,000 is the fee for that. And then throughout the facility, we'll have also noticed that a lot of our furniture, our countertops, our areas were not necessarily the easiest to clean because they weren't solid surfaces. 
So as we upgrade things throughout the facility, we're gonna be investing in things that are cleanable. Um, on the next line here. Um, many of our elevators are used to transport both our residents, our staff, our patients that come into the building, and we discovered that they need to be a stainless steel material. Right now they're wood, unable to be cleaned or sterilized very effectively, and we transport people out to the hospitals that might be COVID positive. Um, we've also investing in a no-touch wheelchair cleanser. Again, the difficulty that we found in our experience with COVID, that it's very hard to clean certain surfaces. Um, we also are gonna invest in some additional dollars for therapy equipment. We've had to deploy equipment since the residents are still isolated on their units. We've deployed the equipment to them. So we're gonna buy additional equipment that we can put on the neighborhoods. We're gonna keep up our levels of our PPEs. Certain specialty beds that are shared will have to be assigned just to pandemic equipment. Hopefully here in the next month or so, we'll be having visitor areas outside as visitor restrictions uplift that we can have kind of a secure area, a cleanable and outside weatherproof area. So we're working with public properties to design those for us, somewhere that they can be shaded, that's easier for families to get to. So that is something that's hopefully upcoming. We're working on the design of those right now. Um, as far as a transportation bus, the one that we have right now can only hold maybe two people with six feet distancing. So we're looking at a different bus that can be used to take people to medical appointments, to activities that again will allow five or six people to be transported at a time. Uh, the final one on infection control is that with the pandemic, we were no longer to use our buffet dining. So all of our uh, residents have been eating in their rooms. They're not allowed communal dining by CDC guidelines. So we are looking at heat retention system and changing the way we're going to process orders into a room service type style where there'll be more choice, more healthier choices for the residents, hot food that can be delivered to the rooms. So that is an option that we're currently, we've already expended 115,000 to get a heat retention system, the trays and everything to keep the food warm. We no longer had that any longer since we went to buffet dining. So we have made that investment. And then the third area that we had kind of a challenge was technology driven. Um, we weren't used to doing Zoom calls and meetings virtually. So we didn't have a lot of phones. We didn't have any Zoom. We didn't have, so we've been encumbered some money there for 20,000 to do those type of things. Um, so the final one is the nurse call system. Um, this has been something that's been discussed for a lot of long-term cares. Normally it's just a call for help, but with a lot of people in isolation, we're wasting a lot of PPE going in for a single item, and there's no way for really for the resident to tell us what they need. So we're going to be looking at for more immediate response um, to limit exposure so you can help the resident in multiple ways before you don up and use all the PPE to go into the room. Um, also, because the residents have been in their rooms now for quite three to four months in their units. We've decided to invest in a, it says Spotify, but the company is actually called Sonify, and it's for resident engagement where you actually take over the TV and you can give communication and education. Now you can do virtual pet visits, church services in each individual's room. The, the residents love the bingo and so forth and they haven't been able to come together. So this will bring it to them in their room. And then we've been doing telehealth um, with all of our doctors. Uh, we do have one provider that does come in, but many of like VA has been willing to do telehealth visits and the med center. Um, our Jerry psychiatrist has been doing telehealth. So again, to keep enough um, technology and laptops and computers around to do so. And the final one is the telework. It was a good thing we had our electronic health record because many of our people that weren't essential, they were able to work at home. So our financial people, our medical records people, a lot of them were able to use technology, we were kind of scrambling, trying to find enough computers and monitors and scanners to make that happen, but that was a very big benefit. And the last thing that we have on there is ANSOS, and that's our scheduling for our nurses. And so when we had outbreaks, we had to go back and do almost like contact tracing. And so if we had to have a more updated system, it would have been an easier job, not so much manual. And then the during the staff shortage, many of the nurses could have looked from home on like a mobile app to see where we were in need of staff. 
So we have had these reviewed by Joe Lorenz and administration. Uh, we've been working with public properties as they're handling the more capital items out of the facility. And Deloitte always did a brief overview as well. Thank you, Aaron. Commissioner Kavanaugh. Thanks for this. Um, mm -hmm. As of today, how many COVID-19 cases among the staff and the residents? Uh, 18 residents, 19 staff, and we had six. Again. Uh, 18 residents, mm -hmm. 19 staff, and, uh, and how many deaths? Six. 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 Correct. And those are all residents. So, yes. Okay. Um, you're currently, I believe, uh, uh, the last I saw from you, is uh, COVID-free. We are correct. That's very good. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions or comments, Commissioner Boyle. Aaron, it's a good report. How many residents do you have in uh, uh, not only the uh, memory section, but also the other sections? How many do you have total? Uh, current census right now is 195. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. 195. 195 total, Correct. okay. And um, I w I'm curious too, whether the, <clears throat> did employees get involved in some of these requests? Yes, I had intentionally sent out an email to all employees asking for input, because I know there was some struggles like with equipment, so trying to make their job easier. Right. because this was definitely a, a challenge that we had never faced. And uh, I remember, I, I didn't see it here, maybe I just missed it, but uh, I, I think it's a great idea, I think, for putting together some kind of sleeping quarters for people that would have to stay. Uh, is that accounted for in this? Uh, no, that would be through public properties through the capital expenditures. Oh, okay. But that was, I believe, the proof. You wouldn't, you wouldn't include that in COVID? Um, that is part of COVID. They'll be coming out of the 166 million through the county. I'm sorry. It's, it's this will be through the 166 million, oh. yeah. All right, good because this is separate funding. And of course, on the computer equipment, this would really apply to everybody, but you'll be working through .com about what to get and everything. Yeah, we'll be getting quotes on all of those. Deal. Nice job, thank you, Aaron. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions for Aaron? Um, if we're gonna take action, what what's the total uh, ask here from the health center? Well, we have 1.2 million. 1.2 million? Yes. Okay. And Commissioner Borgeson is making the motion to approve Commissioner Boyle's seconding. Uh, questions or comments from anybody else? Okay, uh, then let us vote. Yes, they go. Motion passes six to zero. Very good, thank you. Next on the agenda, we have the sheriff. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, Tom Wheeler, Chief Deputy Sheriff. Before you today is a request from the Sheriff's Office for CARES Act funding to purchase equipment needed for first responders to more effectively manage the pandemic. Although this request is from the Sheriff's Office, it represents several public safety agencies within Douglas County. Some of those leaders of those agencies are in the audience today, including Ralston Chief Leonardo, Waterloo Chief Donahue, and Waterloo Fire Chief Harlow. The request centers around a mobile command vehicle that will be utilized by multiple Douglas County jurisdictions and disciplines. Joining Sheriff Dunning and I today is Captain Wayne Hudson and Sergeant Tim Owens. They will be briefing you in more detail about this project. Thank you, Tom. Good morning. Well, I guess it'll be afternoon now. <laughs> good afternoon, Kevin. Can you hear me with the mask on? Pretty good? Okay. Commissioners, thank you for allowing us the opportunity to address you today. Before I begin, I think a little background information is necessary. Sergeant Owens and I are part of the COVID-19 Unified Command. This command structure was established by city and county officials to coordinate the overall response to the excuse me, to COVID-19. I, along with Dr. Adi Poor, Deputy Chief Greg Gonzalez, Assistant Fire Chief Joe Salcedo and Fire Chief Travis Harlow are voting members of the Unified Command. 
I also sit on another committee that is preparing for the mass vaccinations of Douglas County residents. In addressing the issue of COVID-19, we took a hard look at what available assets we currently have that will allow us to provide the necessary services to the citizens of Douglas County and in, in the most efficient and safest manner. The one asset that we identified is a mobile command center. Outside the city of Omaha, no other agency in Douglas County has a mobile command center. A mobile command center is necessary because it will allow us the ability to critically, excuse me, to take critically needed resources to fight the coronavirus directly to the citizens of Douglas County. In exploring the idea of a command center, we reached out to police chiefs and fire chiefs along with the technical support manager for 911 and the Douglas County Emergency Management Director. Sergeant Owens will now give out a, um, is going to hand you a letter and support from the first responders of Douglas County. First, we were seeking their thoughts on collaborating on a one command center. Second, we wanted their input on exactly what they needed in the mobile command center to fully run their operations in support of the fighting COVID-19. Sergeant Owens will go into more detail about the command vehicle. Good afternoon, Tim Owens with the Douglas County Sheriff's Office. In looking with um, coming out of this max vaccination planning meeting, we met with uh, contacted partner agencies with public safety and we identified that need that this resource does not exist and we needed something um, that could uh, that we could deploy in Douglas County to address the upcoming needs for mass vaccination or mobile testing if that would occur again. We also looked at, out into the across the country to see what the best practices are across the country, what are other public safety agencies doing across the country, and it's very clear that they're deploying these units across the country um, to deal with this epidemic. Most of these photos are from uh, drive-through testing sites because that's the phase it's currently in, and I would imagine that in the future when the mass vaccination plans come forward that these resources will be used uh, as well to support those missions. It's been apparent that city, county resources, federal resources um, like this are being deployed across the country. And so we identify that this is a reasonable need, a necessary need for the public safety agencies within Douglas County. So our project began with the need. We identified that need. We feel that this is the best practice moving forward for public safety. And we are really focused on this as a joint agency resource. So this isn't just a sheriff's office request. This is a need for all of the uh, first responders in Douglas County that they will have access to this vehicle um, so they can deploy it to meet the needs of their communities. And this idea isn't unique to us. If you look across the country, like this uh, gray vehicle in the bottom, it, multiple agencies across the country use joint vehicles because of the um, investment um, and the size of the vehicle. So this is. Uh, one used by the city of Fremont in California by their fire department, police department, emergency management. So we decided, decided that this would needs to be a joint agency resource. But I think we, we also are at Douglas County are in a unique uh, position. All these agencies who have deployed these resources for these drive-through testing probably never bought these vehicles with this in mind so that they uh, are now adapting their needs uh, to redress COVID. We're in a unique spot where we can uh, build this vehicle around that pandemic response. We can include items in this vehicle that we need uh, in the max vaccination. We can incorporate this so when it is delivered to us, it will address and respond to the needs that we need. What could that look like? Um, in talking with vendors, we can put refrigerations inside and outside of this vehicle for, um, uh, for, te for testing, uh, for the testing and the mass vaccinations. Um, also, we could create dual enclosures like this vehicle has, but we'd also enclose the entire workspace on the left or right side of the vehicle so that this is a public health, this is a public health issue, so that it needs to be privacy. Um, so we would put enclosures to shield uh, all of the public from, 
from the elements and also keep it as a private area. And then we'd also have a, a secure workspace for first responders in the inside of the vehicle as well. Uh, because, since this is a joint venture, we wanna make sure that uh, all the technology that we incorporate in this vehicle is, uh, meets the needs of all of our partner agencies. We just, we want, if this is deployed to Waterloo or Ponca Hills, that they, we incorporate all the technology they need so they can uh, complete their mission, that this isn't just a sheriff's office owned vehicle and that they can't use it as well. So all these uh, agencies have different needs and we will meet with them to meet their needs. Um, that includes emergency management, 911, fire, and EMS, and our partner law enforcement agencies. Uh, as Captain Hudson uh, talked about, spoke about our unified command response, um, this pandemic response is, requires work between multiple agencies working under the same roof, and we would incorporate that into the vehicle by creating separate workspace. So if public health need to use the vehicle or and the fire department need to be inside, we'd create separate workstations to keep them safe and secure, separated. Uh, we'd also create workspaces inside and exterior, inside and outside the vehicle, so we could keep all the first responders and everyone who was serving uh, safe. And once again, this is a multi-use resource by multiple jurisdictions, um, like the federal government and this unified command vehicle from the Department of Home and Safe, Home and Homeland Safety, or Tampa Police Department, bought these vehicles probably with the never with the uh, idea of using them in this, in this manner, but they are out there today um, ad addressing this pandemic. So usually they're purchased for search and rescue or disaster response, but um, it just shows how flexible of resource this is that even though it wasn't purchased for that, it's fulfilling their needs um, to address this concern and this, this incident. So our, uh, just the final few points in the command vehicle, this vehicle is completely customizable. We can take input from everyone um, that has partnered with us and meet their needs. Um, this vehicle also important to us was, since it is a considerable investment, that the service life is just is, is acceptable. And the vendors we talk to can expect a 20 to 25 year service life out of this vehicle. Um, and it'll be flexible for future response. If we have to move back into a max, if we're moving to max vaccinations, back into testing phase, that this vehicle will be able to serve that role. Uh, the vendors that we've talked to believe an estimated cost around $1.8 million. Um, you know, if you look at the 15 agencies that this is, we've partnered with, that's about a $120,000 um, investment per agency and over a 20 year lifespan. Um, you know, the first responders in Douglas County believe this is a necessary uh, frontline vehicle for their response for um, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, with that. We are also asking funds to buy um, two message boards. These message boards will be used again to help with the uh, fighting COVID-19. You might be asking how is that done? When we have a testing site set up, we will put the message boards out there or identify it. We can put the message boards out there a few days beforehand, let the residents know, and I'll use an example like King Lake. We can put it at two different entrances to King Lake, let the residents know when the mass vaccination vehicle will be there. And then as that vehicle's there, if something was to occur where we run out of um, uh, testing material, we can inst uh, instantly send a message out to that message board, letting everybody know that the site is now closed and give them update information on when the next testing site will be open. So again, we can send instant messages out to these message boards. The last item we're asking for is a, uh, a remote control uh, camera. That camera can be placed at our, at our testing sites to monitor everything that's going on on the testing site. With that, we'll answer any questions that you may have. Okay, so uh, thank you, uh, Captain Hudson. So, okay, why are you talking about vaccinations and not the Board of Health and the Health Department? Well, we're all gonna be talking about that. Like I said, I'm part of their, uh, their uh, that subcommittee that's gonna be looking at different mass vaccination spots. 
So I'm just curious, why is it, I mean, why was it in your presentation and not the health department's presentation a couple of weeks ago? I, that, that I couldn't tell you. So the health department knows about it? Knows about what? This. It was briefed in one of our, our um, calls that we will be trying to get a vehicle so that we can help with mass vaccinations, yes. Who's gonna do the vaccination? Uh, whoever the health department contract with or the health department. So on the, our role is a support role. So we will bring this vehicle out as along with the health department. No, I get it. I just okay. like why, I'm just curious why are you all doing it not the health department and, and the, and I'm just wondering does the health department know? If not, I'm not I'm not against this. I mm -hmm. just want to, I'm trying to get a, because you all talking about vaccinations, there's a, I would envision to hear the health department saying they're on board or where they're at with it. Because I like, guess my next question is, have all the bodies agreed to maintaining this over the 20 years? No, and that's, that's the thing. So it would be purchased by the Sheriff Department, um, well, through the CARES Act. So we would be responsible for maintaining it. We like the county. We are we gonna get a, in a local agreement with the other bodies? We have a local, as far as use of it, yes. And maintenance? Well, that we hadn't discussed. Okay. Um, My only, my only issue with it is I feel like there's a gap with the health department because the officer mentioned it was a public health issue. So I'm just like, there's, it's a, vaccine, it's a vaccine vehicle, but I don't see anything with the public health department in it. So that's my, that's my main deal other than that. You know, I would like to know where, where they're at and for the Board of Health to see that also. So, but other than that, um, I'd like to know their view on it and see how it works out. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. How long, how big is it? 20, 30 feet or something? Or? 45 feet. 45 feet long. Okay. And, um, uh, you know, I mean, it's, um, it's kind of startling the kind of things you're talking about. I mean, I was going to ask some of the same questions about vaccinations and everything. I, you know, they um, what they've been doing I, to some, with some success is just moving these sites. They're not doing vaccinations yet, but they're doing testing and they move them 50th and G and they do other things and, and open up sites and churches and stuff. And uh, I don't know. I mean, it seems like this might be a solution in search of a problem. I don't know. Maybe it seems like a little bit backwards, but um, the. Um, there's something you've got under technology that I've got on my computer. I don't see, didn't see it show up, but it's, it's got technology. It's three million ninety-eight thousand seven hundred fifty-five dollars and fifty-six cents. Does that ring a bell? No. Maybe I'm looking, am I looking at the wrong thing? Well, I got medical equipment, sanitation supplies. I wonder what. Maybe I'm in the You're wrong. In the corrections. Oh, I'm in corrections. Okay. Well, I guess I switched on past that then. Okay, yeah, all right, well, you're right, exactly. Okay, well, it's all connected with nine here. Um, when I was talking to the sheriff, I was saying, you know, that uh, what, you know, we're talking about the other, with other communities and so forth, yes, he had, and, but he, I asked, um, what about Omaha? And he said, Omaha already has one. So, I mean, how many do we really need in this community if you have these, uh, you have to have your own? I mean, I don't understand it. I, it seems like if there's a, problem, you're going to use it wherever it comes from. You know, I, I just, I don't know about, I worry about the call, the duplication of it and the need for, you know, uh, rent assistance and helping people is. Awful. Yeah, Omaha, when I, and I, and I think I told you seven, 17 agencies, it's actually 15. Sorry, I couldn't hear you. Uh, and as far as your question about Omaha having one, Omaha yeah. has a command post type vehicle, yeah. but it's not set up like this at all. It's strictly for responding to, um, crime scenes and incidents and that sort of thing. And uh, what, would it be, what would it be doing when you're not doing, I mean, you're not, you really, the health department's out there doing these uh, testing and all that other stuff. And I imagine, you know, vaccinations, I mean, who's gonna do that? It has to be the nurses or somebody. You get yeah, it definitely won't be me. You wouldn't Pardon want me? me sticking you with a needle. <laughs> I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you, your man. I said, you wouldn't want me sticking you with a no, needle. No, no, well, definitely not you and me. You and me huh? Anyway, uh, 
40 shots? No, no we <laughs> obviously it would have to be a partnership with the health department. Yeah. I mean, that okay, they well, would I, be the driving force of yeah. that type of activity. Um, I, I'll tell you the truth. It's really, to me, is pretty, uh, I, I, it seems it's a duplication. And I mean, I just don't, you know, I, I don't really see you fitting into some of these things because uh, all this health, all, all the things with the pandemic are being handled by the health department and they're they're doing the testing and they're doing everything and you know they're ha having difficulty getting uh, well it's just it's all being held by the health department and i don't see what your your role is here to be honest i mean i don't think it's a need what's the problem how come i, I can't see there's a need what's what can well, you the, tell me about the, all this the need is providing the opportunity to go out to various locations and conduct this activity. Well, what, that's what they do now. They don't need a, a million dollar van to do it. I mean, I, I, Sarah, I don't, I'm sorry. I don't know that they're doing it in, in mass right now. Well, I think it's kind of hit and miss. I mean, I mean, if, if someone needs it in Waterloo, they need to ask and then they'll, if they can't get it because of shortage of equipment, there's that, that's going on, those things, but. Well, we're not doing any vaccination now because we, have, we, well, we, we, we don't even have one yet. We don't have the vaccination. Right, so that's, I mean, I think that in your presentation, I think that was the main thrust. Travis, you wanna make a comment? Uh, Travis Harlow, Fire Chief, Waterloo Fire, part yeah. of the Unified Command for the COVID-19. We kind of got two separate incidents. We got the COVID-19 and the testing as we're working into vaccinations, we working with the health department through the unified command is predicting that probably after the first of the year that we'll need to be start mobilizing to be able to give the mass vaccinations. So what we're working to do in the Douglas County portion of it is gonna have to be in your outlying areas and the local fire departments are going to coordinate with the health department in order to coordinate the vaccinations. The fire or police are not in any way gonna be the ones uh, given the vaccination, no. but we're gonna be the support behind it. Traffic control, taking registrations. You take the city of Omaha outside of the small jurisdictions of the Douglas County towns, and that's where this command post is gonna be very, very helpful for us to be able to have uh, a place to mobilize and to work out of, because we might be on a city street somewhere around no buildings, because we got to allow for traffic flow to be able to flow through. We got to have some type of mobile building to be able to support the needs of that vaccination. It might be down a, a main thoroughfare highway away from all buildings because that's the only place in these smaller communities that will be able to allow for heavy flow of traffic to be able to come through. Because when we start talking mass vaccination, and this is all coordinated the vaccination through the health department with Terry Morrow and working at, as the vaccination portion of it, um, that we might have to go to a, a, say a Highway 275 and set up a command post to allow that heavy traffic flow to be able to come through to do three, four, 5,000 uh, people in a day. So do the, do the people go into the vehicle to get the shot or do they? Um, n not necessarily, no, but the, the vehicle, it will be equipped for, uh, to be able to hold the vaccinations in of refrigeration, be able to hold paperwork, uh, be able to, if it's hot out or cold out, to be able to have, keep your supplies within this uh, vehicle. Okay, so I don't know if I understood you. You say that people will be going inside to get the shots, uh, I got the paperwork in there or what? No, I'm not 100% positive of the uh, okay. throughput. I mean, ultimately it's to keep them in their car going through, but we'll keep them out. That's the initial thought is to keep them in their car and keep them going on down the highway. So but there'll be points of registration before they get up because there's no way to be able to have enough uh, personnel to give the vaccinations and do the registration and to keep traffic control. So there's gonna be a lot of uh, personnel from different agencies that will be able to have to coordinate that. Well, I guess I just don't picture people driving up in a car and exposing their arm and getting I, a vaccination through the window and then going on, I mean, I just, I, I think that's gonna be, I just don't picture it that way. And I don't think the health department's planning on I, that. I just don't, have you, did they tell you that they were gonna do them in car? Uh, a year ago, would have you pictured someone come pulling up in a car and a Q-tip going in their nose? Either? Well, that's different. I mean, yeah, I had that done. That's the way that's being talked right now, how it's gonna happen. But I did it out at the College of St. Mary and there was a tent and they, you know, army, yeah. somebody was out there, the army was out there doing yeah. the traffic stuff. When you got that's thousands right. of people that you gotta vaccinate, keeping them in their car is probably gonna be the best and easiest way to do it. They'll probably have one stop where they'll register 
and then when they get up to the next point of the line, they'll have uh, paramedics, nurse, nurse practitioners, uh, and on up that will be able to give the vaccination. Well, I don't really, well, I don't want to be argumentative, but when I was got my thing, I got my nose deal, I came in, <clears throat> there was a, some kind of a temporary tent, mm -hmm. and I came through that and, and got taken care of. And uh, I, I, I don't see why we'd have to spend over a million dollars to buy this vehicle um, so you could, you would be standing outside giving them a vaccination. I don't understand it. Anyway, I, I just don't get this. I think we need to go back to the drawing board and talk to the health department and see exactly what, it, what is the need I, I, I frankly don't see a, a need. I don't mean to be critical. Omaha's got one plus, uh, you know, we, uh, we haven't heard from the health department. Maybe if we hear from them and say, yes, that's what we want to do is stand outside and give shots next to this truck. Uh, I mean, okay, but I, I don't see the yeah. need. I'm kind of, I'm, I, I'm honest to God, I don't. Cause I mean, they're doing what they can. The equipment, the, the uh, uh, you know, the uh, uh, testing equipment seems to be what's holding them up now when they can't go places like 50th and G, but. I just don't see where this truck is needed. I'm sorry. I don't see where it's needed. Thank you, Commissioner. Oh, Commissioner sorry. Commissioner Rogers. Uh, just because of lack of time and some more presentations, this, this is what I would like to ask. Can you all, because the health director is the head of Unified Command in, in the pandemic, right? Uh, yes. 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 One of the five. Yeah. One of the five. Okay. So what I'd like to ask if, I don't think this is need today. Can you all sit down and talk to them? Because the budget that they presented a couple of weeks ago is money for mass vaccinations and money for a van. And so I kind of understand, I think, what, what's, what you're trying to do. But the concept of what you're talking about is not new. That's Test Nebraska. That happens every day around here. They drive up, they get it. But the, the square point is I know there's money in the health department's presentation to do mass vaccinations. There's about six million in there. There's money in there for a piece. So if, I mean, if you all could just sit down and coordinate this and see how it ties together, I'd feel more comfortable. Because right now I'm thinking it's there and they're programmed to do it. I feel like you all are giving a health presentation. I feel like the sheriff is giving the health department's presentation. So I'm just asking if you all can sit down with them before we do anything. Okay. Commissioner Burson. And I'm fine if you would like him to sit down with the health department, but I get it in terms of the um, coordination of those mass vaccinations. Um, when, when you go and do something like that, there has to be a command center. And what the point is, is that we don't have a command center mm -hmm. in the western part of the county to handle that. And there are people who actually live in the mm -hmm. western part of Douglas County. And so I get that this would be utilized for that, and I think it is a need, and they've demonstrated that there's a need, so I support this. Thank you, and, and I do too, although uh, I'm also okay with doing a little more homework here before, is that what you're asking is, 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 is a chance to? Well, if you just hold it over to the... Um, we don't have to have a motion. It's yeah, we can on. just hold it, yeah. We just don't. Because I... I I'd rather have a conversation because I see what you're trying to do, but I feel like it needs to be tied up a little better. All right. Okay. So I, I believe the sentiment of the board is that we'll take this up again in two weeks okay. uh, with a chance to talk to Dr. Poore a little bit between Thank now you. and then. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Okay. Uh, shoot, where are we at? The uh, correction. So, and, and commissioners, if we could do rental assistance before corrections, because I've been told by Joe that corrections can wait two weeks, but rental assistance really can't. All right, and and we do have to be out of here by 1.30. So with apologies, corrections, we're gonna hold over for two weeks on, on getting to you probably. Uh, I, I, I do apologize for that. Um, rental assistance.
Dan just handed everybody the uh, page nine. We had some changes, so that was um, just handed out to everybody. Uh, page nine of the slides. Page nine of the slides is what Dan just gave a replacement to. We submitted, yes, because there was a change from the one we submitted on Friday. Uh, Melissa Sewick, Director of General Assistance. So this is the update as of this morning uh, for the rental assistance program. So um, as you guys know, on June 23rd, uh, the Douglas County Board approved $10 million for rent assistance. Um, we've had some changes as far as to our focus um, population and then the amounts of uh, rental assistance we are hoping to give. Uh, so the Douglas County CARES Rental Assistance Program provides funds to assist low to moderate income eligible county residents with unpaid rent due to a COVID-19 related hardship. This program is intended to stabilize housing for the low to moderate income, 100% AMI or below residents and those at greater risk due to a loss of employment and or loss of work hours or wages due to COVID-19. So that has been a change. We were at 80% AMI or below, and now we have gone up to 100% AMI or below. Uh, this is also another uh, change. Douglas County CARES Rental Assistance Program's assistance shall not exceed four months of a household's rental need and or a maximum benefit of 4,000, whichever comes first. Previously, it was three months and 3,000. Now it's four months and 4,000 max benefit. General requirements are Douglas County resident, U.S. citizen or qualified resident alien, had a household income below 100% of the area median income before COVID-19, the applicant is listed in the rental slash lease agreement, income was negatively impacted due to COVID-19, and the inability to pay rent due to COVID-19. Um, for our previous presentation, we had in there that if you were receiving the extra $600 uh, weekly benefit from unemployment, you are not eligible for this program. That also has been taken out. This is um, just a table showing everyone the 100% area median income, what it looks like as far as persons in the family, and the income limits. Required documentation, a photo ID, demonstration of financial hardship in the pay, uh, form of pay stubs or income documentation. Pretty much what they need to show us is that prior to COVID, um, what their situation was as far as income and then that they have negatively been infected by COVID-19. Um, so show uh, late March, April income statement or unemployment letter, letter from your job. Um, we need a copy of the current lease, verification from the landlord stating the amounts um, slash months rent is owed. And if it, you have one, a notice to vacate or a vic notice of eviction. We need a completed W-9 from the landlord, and that is to issue payment. And then we um, are requiring all landlords to attest that they are not going to evict um, anyone that we authorize payment for, for those months um, that payment was given. And this is kind of just what the process is going to look like. So the applicant will use the Douglas County website to apply for assistance. A notification will be sent to the landlord that um, said applicant has applied for assistance. We need you to uh, fill out this W-9 and attest that you will not evict the person and also attest to the amount that is owed. Once we get that, we will. the plan is to have um, a Deloitte staff member. We have Deloitte level one. Um, uh, so for them to review the application and make sure everything, we have everything we need. And then the Deloitte level two staff member will just do a quick glance, making sure that everything looks good. At that time, it will come to our department for a final quality control review. And we will go ahead and issue payment for rental assistance. And then payment is submitted to the approved landlord for rent owed by the applicant through the clerk's office. Some additional information. Um, so we have the application and all the supporting documents are going to be available in English and Spanish. We are hosting um, all the program information electronically so we can use Google Translate. So all of the documents, the application, everything could be translated into the various um, languages that are spoken throughout our county. Um, detailed information about the program was going to be shared countywide with nonprofits, churches, landlord associations, Douglas County residents, et cetera, before the application is live. And then to limit uh, barriers for applications, 
We are requiring as little information and documentation as possible. Um, everything that we are re requesting is in order to be in compliance with the CARES funding. And then um, throughout the whole process, applicants and landlords are going to be notified of the status. So we are going to have an email that will go out once the application has been submitted to the applicant and then to the landlord. Once we get that information back, um, our goal is to say, hey, we've gotten it in, um, we're processing it. Once you're, um, you've been approved, or if there's some um, issue with your application, notification will go out again. Um, and then it will go out uh, once the payment has been approved and submitted. Um, and also, um, well, I'll go through this real quick. So the key activities, we are going to finalize the overall program design um, to include the target population, assistance amounts, application, approval process, technical assistance product process, and communication protocols. We have pretty much all of that um, down. We just need final approval from the board as far as the changes that we have made today. Um, finalize the program documentation, include program overview, guidelines, frequently asked questions, and program application. Again, all of that is done. We just have to make some changes based on what is um, what we get the okay for today. Uh, finalized payment process with the county clerk's office and finance. Again, we have pretty much that process done. We've worked uh, really well with Deloitte and the county clerk's office. Design and configure updates needed for Douglas County website to publish program information, provide the inf official link to the application process and share future program results. Majority of that is done as well. Uh, next one, publish program materials on the website for applicants to get familiar with the program requirements, gather necessary information, receive technical in, uh, assistance, and coordinate with landlords. We um, had meetings yesterday evening, and we have come to the date that this will be um, live pushed with your approval um, to the website this Friday. Um, the goal of that is to have all of the program information on our website, to have um, a step-by-step -step of what the application is going to look like, how you apply, frequently asked questions, all of that is going to be on there. Again, it's gonna be easily translated um, through Google Translate. Um, our, it's been amazing to see how, how much .com they worked um, all day long, um, morning, noon, and night, over the weekend to get this up and running. We have the application um, basically done as far as what it looks like. We're working on the back-end stuff right now. So we wanna get that pushed out as quickly as possible to give everybody a fair and equitable shot at applying so they can gather their documentation. We can work with the nonprofits. Um, our goal is also to do a short video walking through the application process um, so people can watch it ahead of time and then possibly have a Zoom session that you know, we can put a blast through the match list serve um, so people can get on. If we didn't answer your question that you can go ahead and ask it at that time. At that time. Um, the next step is to complete the configuration of technology applications to intake and approval applications, process payments, provide data for requiring reporting, um, then to complete the onboarding and training and preparation for staff to process applications, provide technical assistance, make payments, prepare reports, et cetera. Um, we're, again, already doing that with our general assistance team. We have everybody lined up on who's going to be doing what, um, and then we're just doing final training. And then activate the application link on the website to go live. So that is set for Monday, July 27th. Um, we talked about going live on that Friday, I think it's the 24th. The issue with that is strictly we go live and then we're gone for the weekend. And we don't want that where people are not able to apply. They have questions. Um, applications are going to be processed on first come, first serve. So we really, again, it goes back to being fair and equitable for everybody to kind of have a fair shot of applying for this assistance. Specifically, we are opening it up to a greater percentage of AMI we're when we're doing less restrictions. So the pool of applicants is going to be greater than earlier anticipated. Um, we also are going to be providing all of, if we work with Deloitte, all the Deloitte staff um, resources as far as who can be contacted in the community for things as food, additional housing resources, energy assistance, um, legal aid, all of those things. We are going to have a snapshot of what we give our staff and our department. We are going to give that to Deloitte as well so they can have that to easily reference. So just really quick, a um, couple of things. I I'm asking that the county board approve an increase to at least $20 million because since we're going up to 
of that income um, factor, that is going to bring in more people and the money's gonna go faster. So that's what I'm gonna ask you. And, and the other thing is in relation to um, undocumented residents, we had a call, Zoom call with uh, uh, Harris County, which is the city of Houston, I believe. And they said that they steered away from when the city of Houston did their rental assistance, going to landlords, they steered away from undocumented uh, residents because of the very concerns that we have about um, federal government saying no, because they've said no under the CARES Act for stimulus checks. And what I've been told is that Congress is saying, we're not gonna revisit, we've already addressed it. When we did the stimulus checks, that was the message that we sent. It's not, it doesn't go to undocumented residents. So that's, that is the direction that nationwide jurisdictions are getting. As much as I would love to do that, and I really would, um, we all believe that it, that it would come back on us to repay that. Um, what the city of Houston did is they used their own general fund money to do that. And we believe that nonprofits might have some money freed up with this program. Since we're doing this with CARES Act money, they might have some money freed up to help undocumented residents with their rental assistance. So we, we are asking to do it today before 1.30 to increase it to $20 million, to, to take away the $600 restriction, to increase it from uh, th to four months and $4,000, and um, to go to 100% AMI. Um, well, I have several commissioners that have asked to speak, and, and we are really tight on time. Commissioner Cavanaugh. Thank you. Um, I would uh, definitely make the motion to go to the $20 million um, but I would include in that some uh, edits. Um, there's no reason to have a, a four-month, $4,000 uh, limitation in there. This is CARES money. It runs from the receipt in April to December. So I would make a nine months, $9,000. I would um, also add that households had household income at or below 100%. This says at 100% uh, of the uh, median family income for our community. Um, the applications need to be in paper form as well as electronic form. Uh, it is blatant ageism not to have paper forms for old people who don't have electronic platforms. And I shouldn't be pointing this out to you because we've talked about it before. All of the points in here where it's application electronically uh, need to be amended so that they can make paper applications as well. We need to eliminate the non-statutory requirement of citizenship. As uh, Mr. Bloomingdale has pointed out, it's not in the CARE statute as a requirement for this aid. It was in another section for another thing. And if in the fullness of time, next year, hopefully, a new administration comes back and wants to audit this, we might be out a few thousand dollars for people who can't prove uh, citizenship under this. A few thousand dollars is well worth the risk to a half a billion dollar corporation like the Douglas County uh, Board. So, with those mod minor modifications, uh, I think that we can move ahead. It's unfortunate that this would only hit the streets on uh, the 27th of this month. And I guess my one question to our director would be, then when could people get rent assistance? When could they actually receive rent assistance? Our plan is obviously the first application we're getting, we are gonna be processing it right away. We plan to have 25 staff members dedicated specifically to processing applications. And um, if we can get a payment or an application process that Monday and um, have it sent to the clerk's office, we can have it for approval for the next board meeting. The thing of it is that we are planning on doing is to notify the landlords that um, kind of a promissory note of this person has been approved this amount of benefits, and this is when you can expect it. Okay, well the next board meeting is the next day. I presume you're not talking about that. No, it'd be the following. Okay, August 2nd. 
I yes. Yes, but we would notify the person, the the applicant and the landlord immediately via, it's what our goal is, is via email that okay. they have been approved and this is the amount and they can anticipate their check within a certain period of time. Right. So people making application, applying for past months of rent assistance going back to April would already have used up the full 4,000 allocation by August 2nd. And it's another reason that we should just take that off. We're gonna spend this rent assistance until the CARES money runs out in December. That's the, that's the position that we should have. And whatever that's gonna be, that's where we should go. But for purposes of speeding this along, I think that you can administratively make these minor changes as you have since the last hearing that we had last week um, and go with the 20 million figure that Mr. Bloomingdale has proposed here today and get on with it so that by August 2nd, somebody can apply for rent assistance going back to April and their rent bill can be paid. I would make that motion. I just to I just need clarification on what the motion is. Um, we have we have the recommendations before you, and it is for the four months of four thousand dollars. It is for the twenty million and the other items I stated. I know Commissioner Kevin has asked for other things. I'm not sure if those are included in the motion. The the undocumented residents, which obviously I, I would love to support, it would be more. I, I think it would be a few million dollars potentially that would be out rather than a few thousand, but. That's just for your full information. So, and if we go to nine months, we would have nine months, $9,000. That, that's gonna go very fast at 20 million, so that would have to be bumped up pretty significantly. So I just wanna get clarification on what the, what the motion in second is. Today, the 20 million figure that you uh, uh, put out there is acceptable for today, but going okay. forward, we're gonna supplement this and expand it in utilities, food, and medicine as well. Just moving it today for this is is what we're proposing under this motion. So, so what is the motion as we run out of time here? The motion is to accept the uh, increase from 10 to 20 million for rent assistance to eliminate the um, proof of um, citizenship, make it residents of Douglas County, to put paper applications along with electronic applications, and to have it out by August 2nd, before this board for approval, for the first one. Okay. $600. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, yes, I eliminate the four, four month, 4,000, make it nine months, 9,000. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, and the seconder is okay with the motion as presented. All right. Uh, comments to the motion as Commissioner Bergerson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And it, this is making it hard to support, and I'll yeah. tell you why. And that is because doesn't moving it to the 100%, which means somebody with an income of 60900 would be eligible for this rental assistance. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. What I'm saying is we're gonna miss the people that we've been trying to, or talking about trying to help, and that is our low income folks. I think we'll miss them if this is a first come, first serve, on a first come, first serve basis. We're gonna miss our low income folks, which I think we're trying to help. That's just my opinion. I do not, there has been no talk about dollars for food or medicine, so that isn't even on the table right now. They're jumping it to 20 million, and I think again, we should leave it where it is and get it started and then see how things go. We can come back and, and if we just accept the recommendations that we put on the table, we could always come back at, at another county right. board meeting and and hear the um, the other add-on items. Right. We I just want to get we should be doing that this right going. And, and if, again, I won't vote for that motion. I will vote for the recommendations that had been set forth, um, even though I am not in full support. You want to make a substitution? 
Motion? All right. Well, I make a motion that we just approve the recommendation set before us. I'd second that. Yeah. Yes, Commissioner Kavanaugh. I'm not going to uh, say that this is not substantially where it is. It discriminates against uh, non-citizen residents of Douglas County. You're discriminating against those people. It discriminates against old people. You're discriminating against those people. And it does not in any way impair low-income people. That's just a bogus argument. It expands the program to include a large number of middle-class people who have been adversely affected by COVID. It doesn't eliminate anybody on the bottom side. It increases people on the top side. I understand certain people don't want to give any help to individuals through rent assistance, and that's what you're hearing today. I want to do this. I want to do the maximum help that we can as quick as possible, which is make it $1,000 a month for the entire nine months, make it available to every resident of Douglas County, make it available in paper and electronic format, and get on with it. That's the motion, that's the second. Let's vote on that, and then you can you play can't around speak with for how the you second. want to you, deny is, people benefits. Are you okay with that as the second or the motion? Yes. All right, I, we, have, we, we have three minutes. We have more public hearings we have to hold, and I still have a list of commissioners wanting to, to, to speak on this. Commissioner Borgeson. Well, there was a substitute motion to All approve right. what's before us today and move forward. All right, well, all right, so. It doesn't take precedent over the motion. Yes, it does. Uh, a substitute motion does? I know a motion layover has, but a substitute motion? Yes. 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 So we are voting on the substitute motion. Uh, to clarify, this is to go to four months and four thousand dollars. Correct. Take off the six hundred. Take off the six hundred. Go to twenty million dollars. Go to one hundred percent of AMI. Okay. So that's the motion and the second. No, I say leave it at 10 for right now. How far could that one go? Will that get to? It should get that, sh I mean, that, with the, with the idea that we would come back um, in a couple of weeks yeah. to increase it, then that's fine because that's what we will recommend because it's going to go, it'll go pretty quick, quick, but I think we can get through the next two weeks with the 10 million right. and then come back for more. All right, then I'm going to go ahead and call for the vote on the substitute motion. Give me one moment, please. They are not in it. Okay, voting on the substitute motion. Commissioner Cavanaugh. You're supposed to state your conflict if you abstain. I have a conflict. I, I, okay. I have, a, I have a problem with the making up rules as we go along. I, I don't really care what your problem is. How did the yeah, vote go? All right. Can somebody Mo turn Mo his microphone off? Motion passes. Commissioner Rogers, Duda, Morgison, and Morgan voting yes. Thank you. So that takes care of that. It's right there. Okay, we have two minutes left. Um, we have two, I'm gonna, I'm gonna switch. May I please have the floor? Golly, golly, I have two minutes left and I have to do arguing. Can you turn his microphone off? Okay, good. All right, we have two minutes left. I'm gonna rearrange the agenda because we have two public hearings here and people have been waiting. Uh, I'm gonna go to public hearing for class one liquor license. Uh, for uh, First Watch West Village Point, uh, Greg Cutchall. Uh, I will open the public hearing on a liquor license for that. Does anybody wish to address this board during this public hearing? Dan Cavan, 17547 Patrick Ave. I'm here if you have any questions representing First Watch. Thank you. All right, I will, I will close the public hearing. All right, motion and a second to approve. Uh, Mr. Clerk, could we please vote? Motion by, motion by Commissioner 
Morgan, second by Commissioner Boyle. You had, you had to wait four and a half hours for that. <laughs> At least it got Commissioners Cavanaugh and Borgeson. Motion passes six to zero. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I am now going to hold the public hearing for Class C, one, two, three, seven, six, seven, uh, for CAD Restaurant Group doing business at Stone Pizzeria on 1405 South 204th Street in Elkhorn, manager application for Daniel Greed. Yes, sir. Good morning, or good afternoon. Good afternoon. Would anybody like to address us during this public hearing? If not, I will close the public hearing. <laughs> Could you go any faster? Okay, let's, Dan. Let's go ahead and vote on that. The other three public hearings have to do with uh, stormwater, and I apologize to our staff, to Kent and everybody, we don't have time to get to that today. Commissioner Rogers. Motion passes six to zero. Thank you. We did not get to utilities assistance update. Is there something we have to do on that today? No. Joe, do you need to give a utility systems update? Or if are if we there's good? no action we All need right. to take, All then, right, no, we're good. Then, then we're good enough. All right, the last well, I, I, the, we're, we're okay on these public hearings that were published for zoning. Uh, let's continue them for another two weeks. Okay. Uh, the, that, I'm so, not uh, to yet. I'm getting, come to that next. Chair Duda, would you, uh, do, just going off the advice of uh, Teresa Urich, can we open these public meetings I, for C, D, and E, and we'll, we'll continue them to the next I, two weeks? Then we will open now the public hearings for C, D, and E, comprehensive plan and amendments, zoning text amendments, and revisions to stormwater management regulations. Uh, does anybody wish to share anything with us during this public hearing? If not, let us continue this public hearing for two weeks until our next meeting, and with that, I will close those public hearings. No, no, you're, you're leaving them open. I'm leaving them open. Excuse me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right. Um, discussion regarding the importance of wearing masks and operating in safely ventilated spaces. Commissioner Kavanaugh. Well, you've waited until Dr. Four had to go. So thank you for including a 45-minute infomercial from UNMC and making everybody <laughs> sit back and listen to what you think is important because we know who you were. Oh, with. golly. Can somebody shut his mic off again? We, we need to lay this over and tell the appropriate authority who's here. We sat here for three hours, Mr. Chairman, while you played around with your agenda and you made up rules. You know, we used to have civil discourse here. We used to, we used to I'm speaking Zoom. now. Zoom, we had rules. We used to be able to have actual civil discussion on issues. And for some reason, we've lost that ability. Things become personal, petty, and it is very disappointing to me that we no longer are able to practice civil discourse here. It is a disappointment. With that, I will declare the meeting to, I am adjourning the meeting, it's 1.30. Uh, all those in favor can signify by leaving, those opposed can stay. Larry, there was a citizen's comments uh, called for earlier in the meeting. Seriously? Speak up. We're adjourned at 1.32 p.m.